Good evening. This is the Ridgewood Village Council Public Workshop Agenda. The date is April 26, 2023. The time is 7.34 p.m. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission to all persons entitled to same as provided by law of a schedule, including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call. And Deputy Mayor Perrin. Here. Council Member Reynolds. Here. Council Member Weitz. Here. Council Member Winograd. Here. And Mayor Vagianos. Here. Will you all please join us in a flag salute? Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll now proceed to public comment. I'm not sure that's on. Is green light on? There we go. Start over. Matthew Rossi, 516 West Saddle River Road. I'm here tonight because I understand some discussion was had outlying email discussions I had with Councilwoman Winograd during last night's meeting. I wanted to speak tonight to set the record straight. I do also want to say that Siobhan and I did speak today to further clarify this. On February 28th, I emailed Councilwoman Winograd about the Rossi, that's R-O-S-I, not SSI, designation on surrounding Shedler properties and where to find information on that on the village website. I did that for the reason since my property is in that area and I wanted to know more about my property. She did oblige and sent me the information I requested right away and I thank her for that. I in no way stated myself as a spokesperson for the community in any way or a spokesperson for any property other than my own. 516 West Saddle River Road. I especially do not represent 510 West Saddle River Road. All this being said, I believe there's a closed session tonight to work out details on acquiring 510 West Saddle River Road. If that's the case, I do not think this is fair for the village to hide these discussions from the public, many of whom may object for many reasons. In closing, I speak only for my property and I would ask the council for more transparency in proposed land acquisitions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I'm new to this, so <laughs> I'm going to be a newbie. I know most you're, of you. You're going to be great. Uh, uh, Robin Fisher, 412 North Monroe. I am the mom of four kids, each on each of the school district um, levels of school. I come to you to refund the sidewalks of West Glen. And I'll caveat, I understand it's a really hard decision, and you guys are doing it hard work here. You're making choices. The problem is this is a main road. We're not talking about a side street. We're talking about probably the main road in Ridgewood because if you were traveling across town, you wouldn't go to Ridgewood Ave because it's a business district, right? So this is the main road. It's a county road and the speed at which most drivers go are 35 plus miles per hour. And I know because I'm the one calling the 911 once a month, there's been a car accident at this intersection. So we're talking about people speeding, we're talking about people coming from all different towns, crossing our city or our village, and we're talking about kids trying to get to school because there is the main bus stop that commuters use to go to New York City that the high school kids use to go from the west side to the east, and let's remember there's no bus for some of these kids, so that's the only way they get to school. GW is also being fed by these bus stops, and Willard is a walking distance to and have to cross these roads. So you've got a lot of kids. Today there were 15 people at the 715 bus, all of which had to cross Glen and North Monroe in all different directions. And we're not talking just kids, we're talking about adults and commuters. This is an important project. You cannot allow this not to continue, like to, uh, this project not to go forward because 
you want the district to have, you want the village to have business, well, Westsiders need to be able to walk to town to go to the restaurants, right? Because we want to have a, a beverage, you want to bring your kids to the restaurant. Well, if I'm afraid I'm going to get run over on Glen on my way home, then I'm not going to go. You know, you want less congestion? That's another way. We want a walking town. We want a green town. So sidewalks are important. And I know that you have a lot of budget concerns. Let's start it. We've got a county, we've got a federal grant for a safe route to school. Where did that money go? Let's get this project going so that these kids can get to school, so these adults can get to work, so we can go to town. This is a safety issue, and again, it's the main road. I mean, we're not talking about a side street, you know? So I really hope that you will consider putting some money. I know it can't be all, I understand. Put a little. Every year we do a block. Every year we do a little bit. Finally, we'll get a safe town. So, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, and you did great, Robin. Thank you. Hello. I'm Clara De Freitas. I moved to Ridgewood. Clara, could you give us your address, please? Excuse me? Could you give us your address, please? Yes. I'm fr I, uh, 258 West Glen Ave. Thank you. And uh, we moved last summer, and I have a five-year-old daughter uh, that goes to Willard. Mm -hmm. Actually, sorry, she's six. <laughs> uh, and I'm here for the same reason. Uh, the sidewalks is like a big thing for me. Like, it's very important. My daughter walks to Willard every day, and there is no sidewalk for her to do it. So I'm here for the two support the construction of the sidewalk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. You're welcome. Hi. Um, I was going to read something that someone asked me. Is that If you okay? could give us your name and address, sure. please. I'm Niti Mystery 416 Colwell Court, but I'd like to um, By all read means. something and then Absolutely. possibly say a little something for myself if I have time. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, this is for Lynn Dewurst, 176 West Glen Avenue. She writes, one speeding driver who overcorrects, one new driver unsure on a hill that curves, one older driver whose reflexes, reflexes are slowing down, one drunk or stone driver, one distracted driver, that's all it will take on a busy road with almost no reminders of a little posted 25 mile per hour speed limit to tragically change dozens of lives forever. Although my neighbors and I are hoping for the resurrection of the West Glen sidewalk project in full, at a minimum, can the council consider a sidewalk from Alpine to Heights on the even numbered south side where there's already pavement and where the road curves around to S Hill with almost no verge. It would connect to the sidewalk that starts at Heights and continue down to East Glen. Please consider a crosswalk at Alpine where the sidewalk ends would be at the part of the hill with the greatest visibility. There is already a permitted easement on the even side of West Glen according to what we were told in 2021, but even without that easement, the village could exercise eminent domain over four feet of the property at 172, 176, 180, and 184 and build the sidewalk. Finally, I respectfully suggest that the four feet of green space between road and sidewalk as built at the top of the hill when the other portion began is actually unnecessary, particularly if it adds, adds expense and complexity to the project. In this instance, West Glen has plenty of grass and plenty of trees. What we need is a safe place to walk, run, and roll. That was her statement. Um, I just want to add, um, obviously, I'm here to ask to refund the West Glen sidewalk project and complete it this year. Um, I hope we made our case through videos and emails and photos. I just sent a video. I know Lorraine came and walked it with us yesterday, and I think she was scared and understands how treacherous it is. So I really appreciate you coming. Um, I know there's a budgetary issue, um, and uh, but I think I think we can find ways to reduce the cost. But I also want to say let's not compromise the quality. Like let's remember this is a major thoroughfare. As Robin said, this is pretty much the main road. It connects Midland Park all the way to 17. We think maybe thousands pass through, maybe more, we're not sure. Um, so let's not uh, compromise the aesthetic either, because it is. we live in a beautiful town. 
so it can be done beautifully. I think it can be done cost effectively. And let's hope, um, you know, I really hope we can get it done this year. Thank you. Thank you, Nitty. Good evening. Uh, Saurabh Dhani, 390 Bedford Road, Ridgewood. And I'm here to speak in my personal capacity. Um, thank you for your service. And thank you for putting the sidewalk and the uh, pedestrian bridge uh, on the east side, again, back on the agenda today for discussion. Uh, those two projects were taken out, so and I see that though they are back on the agenda, so thank you very much for that. Um, also, thank you, Councilwoman Reynolds, to walk that road uh, with Neeti and the uh, team yesterday. Uh, we all appreciate that. Um, so I understand that the council has some new priorities, and uh, though, but I also think you have the power to issue a bond, so you can bond your new priorities instead of taking money away from the projects that were already in flight. So the sidewalk, the pedestrian bridge, those, those are the projects that I feel most of the projects in this town are stopped at design time because of neighborhood um, concerns or neighbor's position or design concerns or in this case we are working on a county road so we need permissions from the county. So all of that work is already done. The design, the county permission, the neighbors are on board. They, they were initially there was some opposition, now they are all on board. So stopping that project in flight when it's, it's just the, if it's just the money issue and you're reallocating the money, you guys have the power to issue a bond. So uh, 500,000 or a million dollars should not be stopping a project. It's a capital project. It, unless you have some other reason for which you are stopping it, you need to tell us. You need to be thoughtful and transparent with the uh, community that why are you tr planning to stop these two projects when they are already in flight. Um, then, um, I, that was the sidewalk and the bridge project, but I also wanted to understand the rationale, if you can summarize what new expenses are coming this year, which are causing 4.5% uh, or above tax increase, because the flyer that I received mentions about Ridgewood water improvement, but those are bonded separately, and we pay the water fee. So Ridgewood water improvements are not part of the regular operating budget. If they are, they should not be. The Ridgewood Water pays us fee to use the property, so they, they basically pay us money. So we should not be paying from operating budget. Health benefits was mentioned a long time ago at one of the budget meetings, but the governor, is, uh, governor has budgeted $200 million for municipalities. School boards are not getting it, but municipalities are getting it to compensate for the health insurance increase. So he any increase that you have in health insurance is being compensated by Trenton, so that should not be causing any increase to the municipal budget. Um, then the other smaller capital projects you're doing, 40,000 for websites, 60,000 for cans, those are, every year there are some projects. So this year you picked those projects, last year there were probably some other projects, and that still doesn't justify 2.5%, which is like almost 1,200, uh, 1.2 or $1.3 million in, in difference. Um, the other big capital projects you're planning, those should be bonded. So if you have big one-time capital projects for a turf, for acquiring a property, Time. or for improvements, those should, be, those should be bonded. You have the power to bond. Those should not go in operating budget and a recurring increase year after year. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Rob. Uh, Rorick Hallaby, 1 Franklin Avenue. Uh, please arrange for Bob Rooney to have a town meeting with the village residents to present and explain the budget. The VC owes that to the taxpayers. Uh, West Glen, the village as a whole, and not just the residents along the streets are owed a safe walking street with sidewalks on both sides. We should not have to pay for the incompetence of the previous administration and the limited capabilities of the village engineering department. Do it right, and if it's going to cost a million dollars, just do it. Now, let me talk about the disaster that is Shedler. Uh, I read a, I will read a letter I wrote to the Rigid News, uh, but that was not published. My email was to the Rigid News was dated March 17, 2018, five years ago. Uh, the letter is somewhat dated, being written five years ago, but I would say the letter was 
present. I will read a selected parts of the letter, but give the complete letter to Heather for the record. Uh, dear editor, the village council, with one exception, is rushing pell-mell to spend taxpayer funds to restore the Shedler House. I ask they cease and desist from spending a red cent on the house until they can answer the following basic common sense questions. I'm reading excerpts. What makes the house so historically significant? What will the house be restored to? What is the budget for restoring the house and who will pay for it? I hear the figure $600,000 being banded around. What will this cover and how will the number, how is the number arrived at $600,000? Silly me, 2.3 million now. What will the house be used for? Are we short of meeting space in Ridgewood? And if we are, is having space in a hard to reach part of town a sensible thing to, to have? What will it cost to maintain and operate the restored house going forward? I wish we had asked these questions five years ago, then we wouldn't be facing the, 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 the problems that we have right now, including a house that looks like a, uh, a rat nest. I mean, it's just ridiculous, it's unusable. Uh, a group uh, refers to the house as the historic Zabriskie Shedler House, what a great name. The truth of the matter is that if you look at the application filed by Connolly and Hickey, the justification used to register the house is a stretch by any measure. I would say 10% of the houses in Ridgewood qualify for a listing. Uh, if we had tried to answer the questions I pose, we would not be in the picker we presently are in. Look at the design. As an example, if we had agreed beforehand on the use, we probably would have knocked down many of the interior walls to allow for larger meeting spaces that would have made the house more usable. We, we did not do that. And in my humble opinion, short of knocking down the house and increasing the size tenfold, there is no way it could be used for weddings, as someone suggested. I mean, this is so silly. And no way a wood frame house like this can be used to store historical documents and artifacts, as always suggested. What can it be used for? Please tell me. Thank you. Thank you, Rourke. Uh, John Prieto of 663 Wall Street. Uh, members of the Village Council, uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about refunding the sidewalks on West Glen. Uh, sidewalks enhance safety and mobility and help connect communities. My street has sidewalks. It's also straight and fairly level. So we have an advantage over those streets that mostly do not have these features such as West Glen Avenue. I know the potential hazards of West Glen Avenue well uh, because I ride and I run on that uh, street several times a week. For those who live and walk in this area, I can only imagine the added risk of daily exposure. I also know that while this has become an issue about funding, I believe it is more an issue about safety. Pedestrians on West Glen are at a dangerous disadvantage and need every bit of help they can get. So I urge the council to further fund the sidewalks on West Glen and allow the good work to continue to provide safety to pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good evening. Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. I would like to comment about censored dialogue on social media in terms of how it's being disregarded by certain council members. Until recently, the mayor's official Facebook page was in violation of established rules for elected officials by censoring particular comments. Certain comments were blocked from view so that an open and transparent online discussion was not possible. I contacted the village attorney. Another resident contacted the ACLU of New Jersey about this violation. It has been corrected. Similarly, on a private Facebook group,
Councilwoman Winograd regularly posts about village council business. When members of the group reply, she often engages in online discussions with them. Regardless of which Facebook account she is using, it is abundantly clear that she is posting as an elected government official. Comments are regularly deleted from these online discussions. Some citizens are blocked and commenting is sometimes completely cut off. It is the Facebook group administrator's prerogative to do this. However, it is absolutely not the councilwoman's prerogative to conduct discussions about village business that are censored and are not open to all who wish to read or comment. To be clear, Ms. Winograd is not an administrator of this Facebook group. However, she is engaging in discussion about village council business and she is doing so as an elected official. Citizens who are blocked have no opportunity to participate in these online discussions. Ms. Winograd's continued participation indicates her tacit approval of the censorship that is taking place. In order to comply with the Open Public Records Act, these discussions must be open and visible to all and certainly not selectively censored. It is my suggestion that the councilwoman refrain from posting anything regarding official village business on this censored Facebook page. Of course, she can post and participate in any discussions on her page entitled Winograd 2022, which is her official councilwoman page, because by law, this page has to be open to all. I was shocked to learn that the ACLU has received several reports of free speech violations by Ridgewood Council members in the past couple of months. Only one from me. How embarrassing for Ridgewood. Most especially, it is unbelievable that two elected officials who proclaim their devotion to free speech, open dialogue, and transparency are in fact violating these very tenets. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Lipton Miller. Um, I am living um, just a month ago at uh, 33 East Glen Avenue. Um, I've been in communication with my neighbors, Chris and Ellen uh, Wolf and Wolfstern at 35 East Glen as well, so I'm speaking on their behalf. They have a newborn baby. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak first off. Um, there are essentially three issues that I would like to cover today. Um, first, the complexity required for the sidewalks on East Glen, specifically between uh, North Maple Avenue and Oak. Um, two, the risks and liabilities associated with not pr uh, proceeding with the project. And three, whether it falls within the budget. First, as to complexity, we understand that there are certain features of the road which add to the complexity of the project. I've been informed that my property specifically could be one of these, um, specifically the rock retaining wall in front of my property. I have not seen the engineer's concept study, but I merely wish to express my willingness to work with the village, um, whatever may be needed to reduce these complexities concerning my property. Second, um, as to the risks and liabilities, I wish to speak to three. First, the safety of uh, children crossing the road. Second, accessibility for the disabled. And three, trespass issues. Children, um, as Chris and Ellen have previously explained, uh, this block is one of the more dangerous in the village and as everyone else has mentioned as well. Um, to enter and exit our properties, we need to wait until cars are not coming and run across the street. Um, in Chris and Ellen's case, it's made even more challenging with their two-year-old girl and newborn uh, baby. I share those concerns as someone who moved to Ridgewood to have children. Um, my brother also recently moved to Ridgewood and plans to have kids as well. Uh, we share real concerns about our kids' abilities to go and visit each other without the sidewalk. Second, disability. Specific to me, my father-in-law is disabled and I've had unfortunately recurring knee issues uh, which have required surgery, um, including being in a wheelchair and being on crutches. My father-in-law has expressed fear and reservations about even visiting us and leaving our property. Um, and uh, it's pretty disheartening. Um, I seriously fear that if my knee issues reoccur, um, how will I get to work in the morning? Um, as such issues squarely fall within the ADA's protections for the disabled, I'd note various um, cities and municipalities have faced litigation for failing to make streets accessible to the disabled. 
Um, I'd also note the Ridgewood Master Plan specifically includes in its land use recommendations, accessibility recommendations. Including in this are examining, quote, whether pedestrians, uh, cross it, pedestrian crossing is sufficient and safe for people with disabilities. I'd contend the street is not safe for those with disabilities. And third, as to, as to trespass, I, do not any, I don't have any qualms about kids crossing through my lawn um, to get to where they need to go, but fundamentally it is trespass. Throughout the day we see multiple people walk through our yards uh, and along our retaining wall uh, while walking down the street. Uh, while we keep our yards safe, uh, we could face a frivolous lawsuit. Um, I don't want to get a fence to keep people out of my front yard um, and where a sidewalk could entirely resolve the issue. And lastly, as it concerns budget, I've only recently turned my attention to this issue and I'm not familiar with the budget, but I'd contend first, there's room for flexibility for myself and my neighbors who I've spoken with um, as it concerns complexities and um, uh, if there are any ways to get around budgetary issues. Um, and second and most importantly, um, the risks I've identified pose a real threat and a monetary threat. Um, children, the disabled, property rights are all threatened by this lack of sidewalk and there are real dangers that the council can address. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Alex. Good evening. Fretra De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. Um, as a resident of Ridgewood, I certainly sympathize with my neighbors regarding the sidewalks and I hope that you will carefully listen to their petitions as it is truly a matter of safety and well-being for those residents. I came tonight to ask for further transparency with regards to the Shetler property. We understand that the consultant has been engaged as of this week and would hope that uh, his engagement, meaning uh, the objectives and goals that you've set for him, as well as any updates or information that he provides would be publicly available and I guess added to the website so that everyone could see them, so that we could understand what's being done, what his thinking is, uh, what progress is being made. Uh, we just ask for that transparency as, it, as he is being engaged for the public. Thank you. Thank you, Fretcha. Um, if you'll excuse us for just a minute, we take the first 10 public comments. We're gonna take a couple from uh, our hybrid access, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna have time for you, so we'll, we'll return to you, all right? Thank you. And now we have Ellie Gruber. Ellie, are you there? You're on mute, Ellie. There yeah, hi, hi, thank you. Excuse me, too much allergy. Uh, Ellie Gruber, 229 South Irving. I'm here to talk about two things. Last night, I was able to attend the joint meeting of the PRC and Open Space Committees, and I have to say, both those committees do a fantastic job. I think we should be very proud of what they do. They work very hard. During the public comment, before the public comment, we were handed a drawing of the plan for the Shedler Field. It is dated 2022. The plan that you, that you recommended in your resolution is also dated 2022. Chris was up with many iterations I didn't see one plan dated 2023. If you look at them, the engineer's name is, is um, Daniel Dunn. The date is October 2022. So I don't know what iteration you are picking, but unless I'm reading wrong, the date is October 2022. So Chris was here several times, apparently working overtime or using the engineer's money to do a plan, and it's the same plan as before. So unless I'm really reading it wrong, and I do stand to be corrected, it's right in front of me, and I'm looking with a magnifying glass because the plan you handed out at the meeting, the only plan, no electronic copies, also says 2022, October 2022. That's my first question. The second point is I think very much more important. At the public comment, talking about Shedler Field again, of course, most of the people they were talking about it, and the house, one of the, during the discussion, one of the residents said in his comment, and now we're gonna have the extra land. And someone else stood up and said, what extra land? 
And both Ms. Perrin, Ms. Winograd were there saying, we have no plans at this point. But I see on the closed meeting agenda that in fact, you do have plans to buy extra land. And I have a feeling that is what the $500,000 is for. And you heard these people talking about sidewalks. How can you equate this? You took $500,000 that you're spending from your budget. And I agree with Ms. Reynolds, safety, safety is more important than this, than a ball field, than buying an extra for a parking lot. I think it is ethically wrong for a member of the public to be notified about a possible purchase when no one else is. This is a violation. How that resident knew about it is a mystery to me. And I think it should be looked into. And I have recordings of the meeting, so you can just, you can hear them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellie. Susan, you're on mute at the moment. Hello? Hi, Susan. Hi, hold on. Okay, um, um, Susan Ruan, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Um, I want to thank the council for putting the Glen sidewalks back on the agenda. I also want to thank the council for putting um, Kingsbridge footbridge or East Saddle River footbridge back on the agenda. The footbridge has been closed for two years. The alternative roads are far more dangerous um, that residents take than the holes that are in the pathway of the footbridge. Um, I already told, um, well, anyway, since the footbridge is in limbo of being fixed anytime soon, this week I reached out to Congressman um, Josh Guggenheim, um, if that's how you pronounce his name, his office regarding the footbridge in a very detailed email. And I also attached pictures of the footbridge as well as the Hohokus um, police report of the miners, um, the miners accident because the footbridge was closed. Um, Congressman Guggenheim office um, email, emailed me back and asked me to file an official complaint so they can investigate. Um, I hope the village council will pr prioritize um, the footbridge as well as um, West Glen. These are safety issues. These aren't a sports complex that needs to be added to Shether. These are actually people's lives that are in danger. Um, it has been mentioned that 500,000 was allocated to Shedler this year. I'm not certain if that's now being used to purchase a property and that you're putting people's lives secondary because of this complex. Um, which is very disgraceful if you ask me. I've been in the ICU in car accidents, so I know what it feels like and how dare you guys jeopardize people's lives like that. Um, so hopefully these issues will be resolved this year. Um, anyway, as for the closed session that you're having to acquire a property, if it's relating to Shedler, that should be open session. And that should be um, something that you're not doing in secret because this council has prided itself on open dialogue and transparency. And now you're hiding things from people. All right, and I really do hope you guys do take care of these safety issues and that the sports complex isn't your only priority. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Susan. And now we'll return to public comment in person. My name is Yolanda Torres, and I live in 400 North Monroe. I'm simple, I'm a mom, I'm a resident, I live here, I'm a wife, um, I have two daughters, I have a six and an eight year old, and I am right in the corner of Glen and uh, North Monroe. My husband goes to the city three days a week. He has to cross the street, which is a busy street because there's no sidewalk, and then cross the street again. So I fear for him because it's a busy street. Now my daughters are learning how to ride their bike. 
So they also have to cross the street while I'm holding their bicycle and I'm a mom of two little girls holding their bike and having them hold that bike just to cross the street on a busy street. Now, if we had these sidewalks, I wouldn't have to worry about that. All I ask, listen to these people. Don't wait till somebody gets hurt or killed till you guys do something about it. And personally, the, the, I would like for you guys to enclose where the money's going um, since this is, you know, a council where everything is, is stated for the public, um, it would be great um, to see where the budget is and we will have an understanding that, okay, well, they only have a certain amount of money is used on the sidewalk, the rest is used on something that we could all benefit from. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. And with that, I'm going to close public comment. Um, Matt, yes. would you, oh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, Cheyenne Faruqi, uh, 331 Gilbert Street, Ridgewood, New Jersey. Um, I wanted to voice my concern in support for the sidewalks, primarily because our children and residents of all sorts and uh, all sorts of ages and abilities uh, walk along the side of a major road. Uh, as a disability attorney, I get to see the damage that vehicles cause in the human body all the time. I think we should try to prevent such injuries from occurring. Um, thank you so much for considering the inception as well as the completion of the sidewalk uh, on the portions, uh, on the relevant portions of West Glen Avenue. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm now going to close public comment. Matt, would you comment on the issues raised by Ann? Um, yeah, I think I can. Um, First of all, with regard to the issues that Ann brought up with on, um, uh, on the mayor's use of um, his web page. Um, first thing, you know, I, I told Ann I would look into it. She did email me about it. Um, I did look into it. There was no blocking going on. Um, the case that deals with uh, this case, deals with this type of an issue is out of Glenrock, and I think everybody's aware of it. Um, that if a, um, a public official, elected official, uses a, a page for information, the, um, the information, uh, and information about the municipality and about government business, the, um, it becomes a public forum, and the particip continued participation can't, if they're in control of it, can't be blocked. Uh, if there's somebody says something that they don't like, they can't block it out. It has to be open to the public. And that's not what was going on here. Blocking means that people can't participate. And um, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Blocking means that people can't participate. They can't send something in. Um, so in that regard, it was not uh, violative of that Glenrock case. Um, but what it was was a, a different type of thing, which, is, which I think is called hiding, which just sets it aside. It doesn't remove it. It just sets it aside. And uh, my discussions with Paul, nobody knows, you know, my or attorney client privileged, but I can tell you this that as a result of that discussion, Paul, in the interest of being transparent, did go back and put those uh, emails back or those comments back on the page. And so it's been rectified, it's been changed, and that's what's gone on. So that's what's happened. With regard to Siobhan, uh, Ann alerted me to that too. Uh, I did respond to Ann with regard to that. Um, that's on a private page, and uh, Siobhan does not have an, an a public official who wants to participate and in this case even discuss or state things about it, doesn't have control over exactly what gets taken down or what's there because it's a private page. There's a private administrator who controls it. Um, so that wasn't violative of either the Open Public Meetings Act or the public forum issues or the Open Public Records Act. So. I did explain that to Ann, and she accepted it, but, um, and that's pretty much the way that, um, you know, from a legal standpoint, that's where it stood. Thank you, Matt. And we'll move on to the manager's report. Okay. Um, council chat is held on the first Saturday of the month. The next council chat is scheduled for Saturday, May 6th, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. here in the courtroom. <laughs> uh, please call for reservations, 201-670-5500 extension 2207. Walk-ins are welcome, however, reservations have priority. 
The health department will be hosting its annual dog rabies clinic at Graydon parking lot on Wednesday, May 3rd, between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. Please have your dog on a leash. They will be conducting the clinic as a drive-by clinic again this year. As a reminder, all dogs seven months or older must be licensed. Dog license renewals will be sent out via email the last week in April. Uh, renewals are due before June 30th mm -hmm. to avoid the late fee. Uh, the Ridgewood Health Department uh, Stigma Free Committee and community partners are proud to present a mental health comedy show on Thursday, May 18th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at the Ridgewood Library Auditorium. This is free and it's a hilarious and unique performance that will offer a comedic look at mental health. Registration is required. Please call 201-670-5500, extension 2312, or email D Pagani, P-A-G-A-N-I, at ridgewoodnj.net. This program is recommended for individuals 18 years and older, and refreshments will be provided. Early bird registration for Graydon Pool ends on April 30th. This will provide reduced rates for Ridgewood resident adults and children. You can sign up through Community Pass, um, Visa or MasterCard is accepted, and a 3% convenience fee is charged. Preseason badge distribution or in-person assistance will be available on um, May 14th and May 21st from 10 a.m. to noon at Graydon Pool. New for the 2023 Graydon season, families may now purchase a babysitter badge for $195. This badge can be used by live-in nannies, au pairs, multiple daily babysitters over the age of 18, or grandparents caring for the child that day. Please know that those in possession of this special badge may not enter the facility unless they are accompanying the child badge holder and they are not permitted to bring guests during any visit to the pool. Online registration for tennis and pickleball badges is also available on Community Pass. Summer day camp is offered to Ridgewood children entering grades one through six in the fall. The six week program will be from Monday, June 26th through Friday, August 4th um, from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. At this time, um, you may sign up through Community Pass to be put on the wait list. If you have any questions, please contact the Recreation Office at 201-670-5560. As a reminder, the two day per week irrigation regulation is in effect year round. Odd number of dresses may water their lawn, shrubs, flowers, trees on Tuesday and Saturday, and even number of dresses may do so on Wednesday and Sunday. No irrigation is allowed on Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Ridgewood Learn to Ride and Safe Skills course. Kids will learn how to ride a bike with a balance first approach. Instructors will teach kids how to balance and control their bikes with pedals removed. This course teaches youth basic skills to safely ride their bikes. The event will take place on Saturday, May 13th at the Graydon Pool parking lot. Um, learn to Ride, session one is ages five plus, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Safe Bike Skills course, third to 11th grade, 10, 15, a.m. to 11.45 a.m. and Learn to Ride Session 1, ages 5 plus again, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. The cost is $15 for Ridgewood residents and $30 for non-residents. Please register on Community Pass and only sign up for one session before May 5th. Um, this is also posted on the website. Spring into health with us during Ridgewood's 2023 Wellness Series, promoting healthy eating, exercising, financial literacy, environmental sustainability, mental health, and reducing stigma and increasing social support. As part of the wellness events, the Parks and Recreation Department is offering chill out gentle yoga on Mondays in May from 1.30 p.m. to 2.15 p.m. and fishing to free the mind on Saturday, May 29th, two sessions um, either 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 or 12.20 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Please um, register on Community Pass. The annual Touch a Truck event will take place on Thursday, May 18th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Memorial Park at Vanna Square. Imagine having your child taking a seat behind the wheel of a real police cruiser, climbing aboard a shiny fire truck, exploring up close a fleet of the other emergency and public works vehicles you've only seen at a distance. As an added bonus, there will be a Safety Town Kitty Car Driving Track hosted by the Ridgewood Police Department and Little Ivy Learning Center. A special truck story time hosted by the Ridgewood Library and more. No Mow May is an initiative where Ridgewood residents do not mow their lawns in May in order to preserve the habitats of many insects and bees and to promote conversations about the environment. 
The optimal time to leave grass uncut for the benefit of bees and other pollinators is during the month of May. All those interested in participating must register on the village website. It's on the scroll of pictures that goes through. You click on that and you can register. You will then bring your registration to the Ridgewood Library or Recreation Department at the stable to pick up the sign for your lawn to let all your neighbors know that you are helping the environment. The pedestrian plaza where streets are closed to vehicular traffic from Walnut Street to Broad Street along East Ridgewood Avenue will be held on Saturdays and Sundays from June 3rd to October 9th. There will be music and entertainment in Memorial Park at Van Ness Square on Saturday night and Sunday. Each month will be culturally themed and there will be special activities for children. Please plan to come and shop, dine, and enjoy the entertainment this summer. The Cashel Memorial Shell, located on Veterans Field, is celebrating 65 years of music under the stars this summer. The performances are held on Tuesday and Thursday evenings from June through the beginning of August. To help fund the newest season, the Shell is running a community donation campaign with the goal of raising $25,000. Funds raised will be used to produce upcoming events as well as the scholarship fund. The fundraiser um, has five levels of contribution. And if you wish to um, donate, please go to www.cashawmemorialshell.com. All contributing donors will be recognized on the website, while donors that contribute $50 or more will be recognized on a donor wall that will be present at all concerts throughout the 2023 season. Catherine Komsa uh, Schmidt and the First Flight Theater Company are producing Green, the musical, on Thursday, May 4th at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church on East Ridgewood Avenue, and Sunday, May 7th at 2 p.m. at the Ridgewood Public Library. Admission is free. Donations to the Jamboree Scholarship Fund welcome at the door. For more information, please call 201-315-0257 or Catherine S. Komsa at gmail.com. Um, this is an original um, musical. They've written any, everything, my understanding is, from the dialogue to the uh, music, so this would be an interesting thing to go to see. Village Council upcoming meetings are broadcast live from the Village Hall courtroom on the Village website and Channel 34 on Fios. They're also available on Zoom or by phone or YouTube. Upcoming meetings tomorrow night, April 27th, 7.30 p.m., right here in the courtroom is the budget hearing and adoption. May 3rd and May 24th are work sessions beginning at 7.30 p.m. And May 10th is our public meeting at um, 7.30 p.m. Um, the public is invited to join all um, public meetings, work sessions, all meetings except closed sessions. And um, they can join either here in the courtroom or virtually. That's all I have. Thank you, Heather. Let's go to council reports. Evan? Great. Um, I'll be brief. So first, I want to respond to one of the public comments from my friend, Sarab. Um, the issue, Sarab, was not that we're spending more. It's that we're getting less income. Um, we had, for the last few years, COVID relief money, which is now completely dried up. I believe it's $2 million uh, over the last year or two that we now don't have, which blasted a huge hole in our budget. Um, as you mentioned, health care costs are up exponentially. Uh, for all of our village employees. Um, and this last year versus this year, we saw a huge uh, uptick that we have to fund. Um, and then, of course, our biggest, um, our biggest expenses up is personnel and salaries. Um, as we enter into new contracts, fire and police, you know, the bulk of our budget is, is, um, is personnel and salaries. If we agree to 3% raise, that's got to be paid for somehow. And that's even before you get to the steps that they're already entitled to. Um, so all of that goes into how much money we have to uh, how much money that we that we have to shell out versus and collect in the first place versus how much we're spending on things like capital projects or additional costs. Um, additionally, you did also mention the state aid. We have not seen that yet. I'm told we may see it next year, uh, but that has not been distributed to municipalities. It'll be great if we get that for next year because we can use that to offset um, offset our, uh, our our expenditures the way that the previous councils have done so with that COVID money. Uh, but we did not receive any this year. Meaning again, we had a huge hole in our budget um, that otherwise had to be filled. Um, in terms of just sort of a couple of things that I've been a part of over the last week or two, um, so I had the privilege last night of attending the library meeting, um, you know, the author luncheon for all of you, those of you attend, attended, the Fix It workshop they recently held were just huge successes for the library. Um, also got to sit through um, a really wonderful presentation on the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of the Ridgewood Library. Uh, we discussed potentially things that we could do to celebrate that, but um, you know, the Ridgewood Library is absolutely one of the gems of our community, and the fact that it's 100 years old should not go without notice. 
Um, and then also um, was able to hear a lot about some of the improvements they'll be doing to the physical plant, uh, including most notably improvements to a teen area, which I think is going to be spectacular. But even more spectacular is the library does this all with private funding. Um, all comes from the fundraising piece, so the taxpayers get to enjoy the Ridgewood Library. Uh, of course, we pay for part of it, but a lot of these and the most of these extra expenditures and improvements are paid for with private money, which is um, really fantastic. Um, on a more serious note, I know a number of us attended the Interfaith Holocaust Memorial Service the week before last. Um, it was incredibly moving, incredibly thoughtful. Um, you know, one of the things that strikes me about that event every year is that it is attended by all the clergy in our, in our village. It was hosted uh, this year by the Westside Presbyterian Church. It's a beautiful, beautiful building, um, a really meaningful special night. Um, keynote lecturer spoke on uh, Ridgewood's own Barry and Fry, uh, who saved thousands of Jews from the Holocaust. Uh, Ridgewood native and actually a parishioner at that church where we heard the, um, heard the presentation, which again uh, was extremely meaningful. I was really privileged to attend along with most of the council uh, and really just want to say how thankful I am uh, to have been a part of this community and a part of the council to be able to attend events like that. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Siobhan? <coughs> sure. Um, on 415, I had the pleasure of attending RHS and the green team planting 17 trees along Stevens Field. It was wonderful. Um, I went to Ridgewood High School. It was really nice to connect with the students. We were short on sh shovels, so my job was to actually talk and inspire and help and run things. Um, it was, every time I meet with the kids at our school, we're very lucky. They're great, and it was a really nice use of the day, and I'm very grateful to everybody who made that happen, particularly Mr. Bailey, who brought some of his kids there, and Carolyn Jacoby from the Shade Tree and the whole Shade Tree Commission. On um, the same day, I also had the pleasure of attending the Ridgewood Guild pop-up, which was on Main Street next to Bear Burger. And this was very exciting because the Guild is getting more novel with how we're promoting commerce downtown. They brought in a warehouse. Nothing was over $50. It generated a lot of foot traffic, and it also opened up a vacancy in our district and let people see what's inside of it. There was a lot of discussion about the building. It was very vibrant and I'm incredibly grateful to the Guild and everybody on Main Street who's thinking about different ways to get people to come downtown. On Sunday, 416, um, Pam and I had the pleasure of attending Law and Order, Law and Enforcement and EMS Appreciation Day at the Good Shepherd Church in Glen Rock. I want to thank Linda Scarpa for putting it together. It was a lovely service on Easter Sunday, and it was really unique, and I'm very grateful to all the people in our law enforcement and EMS who attended and were honored there. Um, I, too, I want to be brief with it, attended the Holocaust Memorial at Westside Presbyterian, and it was incredibly moving. I think one of the things that we're very lucky to have here is an interfaith board where basically every religion in the municipality and then some get together and they made this decision to have this. It was a speaker series and Varian Fry, who grew up in Ridgewood and is a local hero, um, attended Westside and I thought it was an interesting way to acknowledge him in the place where he actually worshipped and being a Gentile. It was very informative and I'm incredibly grateful to the Interfaith. On 418, I had a meeting 418 and 425, um, the Pride Committee met with the Saga group at the high school and the police to start the discussion of how Pride is going to look this year. It's going to be great. We're working on a student-generated flyer, which, um, please no judgment, is going to be a little late because several of our artists are taking their AP exams next week. But the event is 610, and it's coming together very nicely. And I want to thank everybody from the staff who's been so helpful. We um, also on the same day had a meeting with communications. So with the purchase of the new website, we had a communications discussion with Heather and with Dylan, again, incredibly grateful. We sort of took a look at what we have already. We have several off-the-shelf applications that we use, e-code, and we're trying to take an inventory and get an assessment on each of them. So we also discussed with the website discussing some type of needs analysis and issuing a survey within the community. Not a survey that's broad, but you know, what do you most frequently look for? What's your biggest complaint? What, is, what do you utilize? The Goldilocks question is how much communication, too little, too much, and just right. So you'll be hearing more on communications, and again, I'm very grateful to our staff. Um, and then last night I had the pleasure of attending a meeting with the Parks and Recreation and Conservancy Board, which I'm the liaison, and Pam's Open Space Committee. 
Um, we do this because a lot of our communities have overlap and synergies and we're doing more combined meetings. So it was great. It was very well attended by users of the fields, both passive and recreation. Shedler was there. And I want to say thank you again to my board and Ralph Curry and Rich Brooks for the meeting. I thought it was very informative. I also wanted to just, just address two things from public comment. First of all, Ellie is correct. The rendering does have the wrong date on it. Is, can we get that fixed, Heather? Okay. Um, and then two, with respect to the discussion of open space, because this came up last night, um, we have a document called the Rossi, which is R-O-S-I, and we have an open space committee, and we are very, very lucky to have an open space committee. Um, what that means is that open space is a dedicated line on your tax, similar to the, the library. One half of one cent of every tax, tax dollar you pay goes into the trust for o open space, which is why we have a committee. This is, it, it accrues money, you know, we get money and we build and we build and we kind of create a war chest of money so we can acquire land. It's um, a very useful tool for the municipality. It's one of our largest financial weapons against overdevelopment. Properties such as Habernickel and Shedler could not have been purchased with it because when we have the money, we're more grant worthy and it allows those purchases to occur. I know there's been some discussion and people, I don't want to talk about individual properties, but what adjacent parkland is always appealing to any council. Um, when I was a child across from GW, there were three houses there and the open space has since acquired them and expanded citizens. So I think there's some general concern about that and when it's it said any council would have the responsibility of looking at any adjacent property should it become available. So um, I hope that answers some of those questions, but if you haven't seen the Rossi, you should look at it. We did also have a great discussion of how we're going to promote our parks. And we're gonna start featuring them on Instagram, letting people know the locations so people can understand how wonderful our existing parks are, where they are, and how they came to be. So that's just a little background because open space is a big part of discussion. You know, do, are, there, are, are there future properties that we should buy? How are we gonna have that discussion? And I, I think everybody should look at that document because it gives you the history of what we've done and what, you know, there's no future plan on it. But if we see a large parcel come up for grab, we would want to discuss it as a council. And I think this has been a big issue in Ridgewood because overdevelopment is a concern that all five of us share. Um, so that's it, and sorry for such a long update, but it was two weeks since we met. Thanks, Siobhan. Lorraine? Thank you. Um, first, I just want to clarify something that Heather said. She did the water restrictions odd and even, which is correct, you know, Tuesday and Saturday, Wednesday and Sunday. But what I want to make clear to everybody, because I, I see people, you know, that d probably don't know, others maybe don't care, <laughs> but if you have underground sprinkler systems, the only hours you are allowed to use them are 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. Unless you got a special exemption from the town because you planted new seed or soil or landscaping, and then you can water during other hours. But nobody, nobody, no matter what, exemption, no exemption, is ever allowed to water between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Because that's when the sun is shining, the water evaporates, and we're just wasting water. So never between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you have underground, it's three to seven. If you have regular sprinklers, it has to be before 10 a.m. after 6 p.m. Okay, and this, is, this has been going on, it's like five years, it's not like every year we go into restrictions. We are in restrictions 365 days a year, no matter what the weather is. Um, okay, the Central, the Citizen Safety Advisory Committee met on April 20th. We discussed the unscheduled installation of traffic lights and bump outs on the Franklin Avenue corridor because we've been waiting and waiting and engineering keeps saying, you know, they, they've had the plan for years and they keep saying we're waiting on the county. So it was suggested and I wanted to bring it up. Um, the members said, why doesn't the mayor and the council write a letter and send it to the county and find out what's going on? Let's, you know, like we've been waiting for these traffic lights for years. 
So can we do that? We can absolutely do that. And what I would recommend is since, since CSAC is so familiar with that, if they can help with a draft mm -hmm. um, so that you know, we can take it and send it out. Okay, sounds good. Um, a discussion was held regarding West Glen Avenue sidewalks and how critical their completion is for safety reasons. And hopefully tonight we will do something about it. Uh, East Glen Avenue and Bogart Avenue are also in need of additional lighting. Officer Torino reported that lighting at various intersections throughout the village are being looked at for, repla for placement of LED directional lighting as part of PSE&G's Operation Bright Idea program. So hopefully in the next few months we'll see a lot of intersections with better lighting. A discussion regarding Union Street and people going the wrong way down Union Street uh, was, uh, was had. Yovan from the engineering department was checking into the painting of safety markers and arrows on the street. This has been discussed before, but it was put off and he's not sure where it is right now. He's checking into that. Uh, in addition, Officer Torino is looking into the installation of more one-way signs so that people realize it's a one-way street. A discussion was had regarding public school grounds as walkways for residents and dog walkers. There's a genuine concern about strangers being around the school children. Sheila Brogan suggested better signage and wording, allowing and restricting the use of public school grounds when children are or are not present. So she's kind of going to run with that with the Board of Ed. A resident came to the meeting and voiced concerns regarding the Kingsbridge Lane footbridge being closed for approximately two plus years. There, and we told the resident that it's on discussion for tonight and hopefully some relief will come for those residents. The next CSEC meeting will be held May 18th at 7.30. And I just wanted to say that I did go and meet with some members of the Glen Avenue area yesterday and we walked up and down Glen and it really is treacherous. It was scary, you know, I'm teetering on, on the uh, edge of the curb, cars are going 40, 45 miles an hour. It's really crazy that we have not done something before this. Kids walk in the street there every day going to school. Residents walk their kids in strollers. It's, it's just unacceptable and we really have to just finish the project. Um, that's it, thanks. Thanks Lorraine. Pam? On Sunday, Green Ridgewood the Conservancy for Ridgewood Public Lands and the Parks and Rec Department put on the Daffodil Festival and Earth Day Fair. It was a lot of fun, kind of a nail biter in the beginning because we thought it was going to rain, but five minutes before 11, the rain stopped and there were all kinds of things to see there. I had never even heard of a green real estate agent, but there was one at, at this, our celebration. Um, and the uh, Daffy Dog Parade was a lot of fun, and the band was just superb. Um, that, that was Blue Plate special. And if you missed it this year, come next year. Um, no Mo May uh, was also there, and I heard last that we have 132 homes signed up for No Mo May. And if you're interested, it is free, and uh, if you're in, you know, give it a try. You don't have to use, do your whole lawn. You can just do a section. The Ridgewood Historical Society and Schoolhouse Museum is holding its gala for the 150th anniversary of the schoolhouse. And that's going to be on May 18th at Felina's Restaurant. You can get tickets at ridgewoodhistoricalsociety.org. As uh, Siobhan mentioned, the Open Space <coughs> Committee met with Parks and Rec and um, our main topic of discussion was effectuating the open space plan um, action, action items. And tree planting, well, we may have been short on shovels, but I learned how to swing a pickaxe and, and use a pile driver. Um, my back 
really was feeling it the next day. Um, the Central Business District Advisory Committee met uh, regarding the Chamber of Commerce's strategic plan, which was very interesting. And the consultant that they used, Paula Gavin, in her research and interviewing people, heard a lot that people would like a unified calendar of events in town. And so what she suggested was that the CBDAC could create an annual calendar that would cover downtown events. So we're going to be looking into that. Also, the subcommittee on the pedestrian tunnel met this morning and uh, discussed the mural design and how to execute it. And it really is coming together very nicely. That's all I have. Thank you, Pam. Um, and I'm going to be very brief. Um, I had the good fortune of sitting in for Siobhan at the Access Ridgewood Committee meeting. Um, what a fabulous group of people uh, they are. And their um, main project right now is searching for a location for a bakery that employs residents of our community who have personal challenges of one kind or another. And uh, we had a big discussion about that, had some good ideas came out of it, and they're going to be pursuing that. And Siobhan, you'll be following up with that because I don't think I'll be attending next month, but it was a, it was a real prize. Thank you for asking me to sit, sit in for you. Um, and even though it's been said several times, um, I have to say um, I went to the Holocaust service um, at Westside Prez. And um, I think what caught my attention when I first got there was not that there were um, uh, ministers and priests and rabbis from all different faiths in town, but that the minister from Westside Prez, in his own church, was wearing a yarmulke, as many of us were. And that spoke to me. And I thought, you know, with all that's going on in the world, maybe we can find our way through all of the things that are happening. But it was incredibly moving, and I was so grateful to be there. So, um, and that's the end of my report. And so we will now move on to our regular agenda and okay. our first discussion item. Yes, our first discussion item is uh, disposal of yard waste and yard clippings. Um, we have to get quotes every year. Um, we receive three replies. The recommendation is to award it to RVH Mulch Supply LLC of Wyckoff, New Jersey, not to exceed $24 per cubic yard for a total, not to exceed $75,000. The funding is from the operating budget. Um, last year, RVH's quote was $22 per cubic yard. Um, and if there's a caveat saying if the village experiences a good growing season, additional awards may be needed and just as a reminder, the village is prohibited from disposing our yard waste materials in our leaf compost facility because of our permit with the DEP. Um, Heather, did we used to dispose of yard waste at the, at, at the Lakeview facility? I'll have uh, Chris Rutherford come up. I, it may, if so, it was a long time ago, um, but uh, I don't know how recently we did. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, our current permits and the permits that I've renewed in the past 20 years prohibit grass clippings to go into the leaf compost. The rationale from the DEP's perspective is we do not have a setback distance to the surrounding property owners. The grass, I believe, requires a 1,200-foot setback. Leaves, leaves only, only a 250-foot setback. We have the 250-foot setback for the leaves. We just don't have the distance from the homes for the grass. What about grass actually is very good for the compost. It's an excellent additive mixed into it, but we don't have the setback distance. What about branches and things like that? Uh, when it's picked up, mixed, like uh, grass clippings and branches at the curb, we don't separate out the branches. It all goes out as grass. Oh, okay. I mean, if we pick up brush separately, we, pro we generally run that through the tub grinder to reduce its volume. 
and we also don't mix branches in with the leaf compost. We had an experience with the Halloween nor'easter, uh, I think it was 2011 or 10, that when we picked up everything at the curb, it had a tremendous amount of branches in with the leaves, and our compost the following year was very fibrous because the leaves in a nine, 10 month span decompose very nicely. The branch material, even though it's gone through the tub grinder, is just too fibrous and it degraded the value of the compost. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? And the next item is award of a contract for, just stay there because, award of a contract for disposal of recyclable materials. Um, this is to Atlantic Coast Recycling, which used to be Atlantic Coast Fibers of Passaic, New Jersey, not to exceed 120,000. This is the second optional year of the contract. The funding is in the recycling operating budget. Questions, anyone? Okay. The next item is authorizing execution of a document for treatment works approval for the Prospect PFAS treatment facility. So Ridgewood Water Company is creating the Prospect Street Well Facility, um, putting in the granular activated carbon treatment system for PFAS. Um, this will require discharge of the backwash water to the village sanitary sewer collection system and subsequent treatment at the water pollution control facility. The quantity of the discharge is such that a treatment works approval is required from the NJDEP related to the sanitary sewer discharge. The TWA requires an authorized representative of the village to review and then sign the permit application. It's recommended that Christopher Redesauser, our village engineer, and director of DPW be authorized to sign. Questions, anyone? Okay. Good. So now we have a special public meeting. A motion to suspend the work session? So moved and convene a special public meeting. And convene a special public meeting. Okay, thank you. Any Do second? I have a second? Second. Now, parent, parent, this is just to make sure that we're, we're all adjourning. We're, we're going into, <laughs> here, we're going parent. into the, we're going into the special public meeting. Parent? Here. Reynolds? Here. N no, it's yes. Oh, yes? <laughs> Whites. <laughs> Whites. Yeah, uh, yes. Winograd. Yes. I'm at Janus. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. And so. Now we'll we go to the special meeting. We'll go to our special public meeting. This is the Village Council special, special public meeting. The date is April 26, 2023. The time is 9, excuse me, 8.47 p.m. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission to all persons entitled to same as provided by law of a schedule, including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Here. Council Member Reynolds. Here. Council Member Weitz. Here. Council Member Winograd. Here. And Mayor Vagianos. Here. Following resolutions numbered 23-1, 151 through 23-153 will be adopted by a consent agenda with one vote by the Village Council. There is a brief description beside each resolution to be considered on the consent agenda. The resolutions will be read by title only. 23151, award contract disposal of ground yard waste and grass clippings, Lakeview Compost Facility. 23152, award contract disposal of recyclable materials. 23153, authorize execution of document, treatment works approval, prospect PFAS treatment facility. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. And may I now have a motion to adjourn the special public meeting and, and reconvene? And reconvene. I was going to say it this time. Very good. And reconvene the work session. So moved. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. And now we will continue with our agenda. Yes. So under Richard Water, we have authorizing a lease of the wireless telecommunication antenna at the Glen Avenue tank. Um, this is 
uh, in Midland Park. On March 22nd, Ridgewood Water accepted bids for this lease. It involves the lease of the tank and the ground space. There were three bids picked up and one bid being received. Um, the recommendation is towards the highest responsible bidder, um, DRWNX LLC of Chicago, Illinois, in the amount of $441,600 per year. So um, they will pay um, monthly $36,800 for the tank and ground space, and the rent will commence once they receive their permit approvals and meet the document requirements and the bid specs. Are we currently renting? Yes, to many companies, actually. Um, if Mr. Calvi can come up and let us know. I know there are several on there. Good evening, Mayor Council. Currently on the tank, there are four other providers similar to this type of company. In addition to that, there's one mobile carrier, T-Mobile. This will be the highest rent that we've been able to achieve on the tank and will make up for a good amount of money that the utility needs to pay for PFAS treatment mm -hmm. and other expenses. It's a very good find. Yes. I have to say, as I was reading the the memo on this, every every time we have a bid, it says, I recommend awarding to the lowest bidder. And I, I, the same thing. And <laughs> I read this and it said, I recommend award to the highest responsible bidder. And I thought, typo. And, and then I read, right. I thought, oh, <laughs> that's nice. No, so. This is a, a great thing. And I have to admit, I didn't have, well, I wasn't the only hand in this. Mr. Rogers uh, assisted. Um, we had several interested parties. Uh, they found that there was available space, and we took up on that opportunity to put out the bid for an additional carrier. Well, on behalf uh, of the council, uh, we want to thank you, Mr. Rogers, Heather, because I know you always have a hand in this. So thank you all. This is uh, thank you. W much appreciated. Yes. Rich, when, when does this start? So once the lease is signed, uh, the company will start doing their drawings and submitting for their permits. <coughs> Wants to have permit approval, the, the payment begins. Is, do we budget this into this year's budget, or that's water? It's water. Water's. Oh, it's water. Never mind. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you found I had one. the money spent already. <laughs> I just have one question. Do we have to interface with Midland Park at all on this? The applicant has to. The applicant or whoever is the provider that's awarded has to interface with Midland Park. And so is it, it's, can, did we see any problem with that condition? Did it? It, it suffers the same, you know, benefits and beneficial review that any tower does or any cell tower does and that type of thing. And this is, this is a, uh, it's not perfunctory, but certainly it's a, a process that Midland Park used to. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Good. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rich. Rich. Um, now we're under budget. The first is cancellation of 2022 budget emergency appropriations. We had two, um, emergency budget appropriations in 2022. One was for um, purchase of water pollution control equipment, and one was for uh, bulk purchases for gasoline and diesel fuel. The emergency appropriations were declared to prevent a health and safety issue for the village. Canceling the balances in both appropriations will provide financial relief in the 2023 municipal budget because we will not incur a deferred charge expense. These resolutions will actually be considered tomorrow evening at the um, budget hearing and adoption. Questions? The Good. next item is the refurbishment of the Kingsbridge Lane pedestrian bridge. I'll have Mr. Redesizer come up again. Um, what I do want to let you know is that, um, as you may recall, we hired an independent engineer to provide um, specifications and also an engineer's estimate for the um, refurbishment or the repair of the Kingsbridge Lane pedestrian bridge. Um, the engineer's estimate for the repair is $396,192.26. Um, I incorrectly put the um, dollar amount that we have available to us it is not $33,000, it's $67,801.76. So about $68,000 we have available to us in a bond ordinance which has already been adopted. Part of that was to pay the engineer, and so this is what we have left. Um, 
I'll have Mr. Rodasazer take it from here. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, at the request of the prior council, we solicited an engineering firm to make the necessary repairs to the bridge so it maintains the appearance it currently has, minus the deterioration. The estimate from the engineer is what had I mentioned, th excuse me, 396,000. Um, if the council wishes to go forward with it, I think we need additional funding. Uh, we are ready to go to bid. The plans, specifications are all finished. I just have to write the front end of the bid document. So could I ask a question, Chris? Sure. So I remember this from watching it. Wasn't there the discussion prior to this of replacing the bridge outright? Absolutely. And what was the cost on that? Well, in June 23, 2021, I made a recommendation to replace the bridge. I gave a budget of $325,000 to $375,000 for a new bridge manufactured, delivered, and installed. So is it a modular bridge? Is it made uh, It would be factory, yeah, modular. Okay. Uh, can I keep going with my question? Just because I have sure. so, a Sorry, I sort of jumped in. So with that, um, we did, we, the money for the engineers already been spent. That's gone. And now we need, can we go back to the people for brand new installation? Is that well, allowed? When I looked at a new bridge, I was dealing with a manufacturer. Right. Looking at it as from a design build perspective. Right. This is strictly an engineer on, right. in the traditional manner of design, bid, build. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing for the repair. The other version was design bid. Uh, that's how I recommended it. I mean, but functionally, the bridge is a bridge, yes? There's no, is there any different in functionality if we went with the brand new one? Uh, there are several differences. Um, the bridge that I recommended in 2021 would have to be ADA accessible. Mm -hmm. The current bridge, because it's merely being repaired, one of the tasks that the consultant had to do was confirm whether it needed to be retrofitted to the current ADA standards under PROAG, which is Public Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines. It does not. Okay. So unfortunately, for the members of the community who use a wheelchair or have some disabilities, um, it's still going to be the same old uncomfortable bridge. And is, I mean, I know it's two years ago. Do you know the lead time for the brand new one at the cheaper price? I mean, uh, if you like. The one from two years ago? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think the price from two years ago, we have I to think you could update. safely double or triple that. Okay. Um, I would not put much faith in that price because the supply chain issues mm -hmm. and inflation that we've had in the intervening time have would significantly skew that number at that time it was realistic currently it is not um, so, we, so we can get an updated quote for uh, this for bridge. replacing the bridge mm -hmm. yes we can I don't even want to hazard a guess of what it would cost well they can let us know right they could Okay, so it would be worthwhile to get that so we could see what the price comparison is, right? Um, the other question I have for you, wasn't there something about design build that there was some kind of restriction that we couldn't do this? Uh, yeah, the state of New Jersey adopted a law called Chapter 71 on design build. Um, it took almost a year for finance to get an answer from DCA, I believe, that they only allow the design build for, I think, projects like over $5 million. Don't ask me why. That's, that's an edict out of trend. So can I ask one more question about the funding? What was the plan in terms of money before Evan and I got here, if there's only $67,000 left? That's it. We, we put aside 100000 okay. last year because we had no more money than that in the budget. <laughs> we just figured we'd start with something. And we spent whatever it was, $32,000 on this engineering firm mm -hmm. to, because at that point, we didn't know if it was repairable. Right. These, this engineer says, yes, it is repairable. And we've been waiting all this time to get the estimate for the repair. 
So the question I have, Chris, would this company, Lajita, do the repair? Or they're just telling us what they feel the estimate would come in at? But they have prepared plans and specifications detailing what they recommend be done for the repair. A contractor would have to do that. They're strictly the design firm. Okay. Um, if we go to construction with this project, I will probably have to ask them for a proposal on construction services to oversee that construction work of what they proposed. Is it possible? So we would go out for an RFP on this? Um, an RFP for? Well, for the, for the um, repair. The whole repair, though, no, that would be a straight out public bid. Okay. Uh, anyone, anyone and anyone who wishes to bid on it will have the opportunity to do so. Okay. And are we confident that the bids, like, are we confident that this number is fairly accurate? We could have um, some bids a little lower, some bids higher, like we normally do. It could do. be all over the place. Uh, this is their best guess estimate mm -hmm. on the cost of the work they propose to the bridge. Okay. And then if we were to get an estimate on a new bridge, who would give us that? I would probably contact Contact, Contact, which is a, a design contractor firm, and see if they're interested in giving us a price. And what would that cost? I have to get the price. Okay. I mean, because I think we all know it's. I, I believe it would be well over a million dollars to build new. It could be. Um, one of the big reasons it could be is that. The approaches to the bridge would have to be uh, ADA compliant. You'd have to probably have switchback ramps um, to overcome the elevation that you need. Uh, it would be a certainly a bigger project than the repair work that's being envisioned by this engineer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Um, yeah, Chris, I think that Heather's recommendation is probably the best one is let's see, just for comparison purposes, what Contec will quote us um, at this stage of the game and then proceed from there. Well, but let's I see what they'll charge us well, to, to give us a quote. Right. Well, I mean. Will they charge us to give us a quote or um, will they just give us again, a quote? Again, I don't know. Um, the world has changed a lot in the last two years. so. I don't know how much, if they have any interest. I also don't know what their backlog is. Um, with the repairs, if we bid it out as soon as possible, obviously with the proper funding, I hope to get the work started this year. If the longer we delay, the shorter the construction season we may have available for us. Um, cementatious, work with any kind of cement or cementatious product. Usually it's problematic to do it after, say, November 15th because you're getting into colder weather. I gather that because we don't have any money right now, we would have to go to a spend special bond issue. Uh, that would be most likely the case, um, but I leave that decision up to Heather and Bob Rooney. Yes, that's what we would need to do. Is there any way to do both? I mean, yeah. I, I don't think anyone supports paying to get a price on a new bridge, but I would like to know what it is, mm -hmm. even though I understand it's probably going to be a lot more money. Um, is there a way to go out for an RFP at the same time that we also ask them for, uh, for, for a new price? Because I don't want to build in more time as we wait for you to come back if we can do two, two you know, both, both at the same time. Well, I'm not sure if I understand you correctly. Uh, I would be contacting the vendor that I dealt with in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, if the council would like, I could ask the engineer that's done the repair work what their best estimate would be if they would include that in the, their scope of services for a full replacement bridge. I, I'd like to run three parallel paths, if we could. Excuse Go back, me? three parallel paths, because the sake of time, we should take Lajita Engineering's recommendation and put it out for bid, so we get an idea of what that is and move quickly on the RFP, so we have more information. And is one. that for repair? Yes, so okay. this Lajita for repair. Okay. We then should take Chris's time, which is valuable, and go back to the 2021 and Lahida and talk about two separate you know, kind of verbal quotes of what it would be to build new. So all things go towards the same direction. It, two versions are new, one version is repair, 
and we don't slow down what you're telling us you believe to be the lower cost one of repair so we can get started on reviewing that and potentially approving a bid. Does that make sense, Chris? Um, it can. Uh, the only concern I have is uh, bidding this work will be uh, an effort on a bidders. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are in the game to hopefully be the low bidder and awarded the work. Uh, I just had a meeting today with a paving contractor who was expecting three million dollars of work from the village and I only awarded him a million because that's all the funds I had available at this time. Mm -hmm. um, they were, let's just say, miffed um, and they are currently thinking about whether they are going to sign the contract and return it to us for the one million dollar wor worth of work or if they're going to walk away. And if they walk away, I would have to go to the second low bidder and obviously that would be at a higher price. And it would also delay the work because I'd have to go through the resolution of award process with you folks. Right. I think the point that Chris is raising is we have put, uh, we have in our budget that we're going to be approving what we have perceived to be the maximum amount that we want to go out to bond this year. And so the issue would be do we want to exceed that amount this year or put this off until next year. So I'm going to ask Heather for her opinion on this because I know that the way I, I believe it, we understand it, is we try and stay right around that seven and a half million dollars a year and we cut out many other important projects. Not to say that this is more or less important than any of those, but to Chris's point, we don't want to, we, we often put things out to bid and don't get bidders. We do not want to solicit bids and then decide not to award. So I think we, before we ask for bids, we need to make a determination as to whether or not we want to spend that money this year and whether we're in a position to do that this year. So what I would like to recommend is that Chris go back out to the 2021 quote and see if they'll update that quote. Then we can bring it back to next week's meeting and we could discuss it. Then the council can make a decision. Do you want to go for repair? Do you want to go for replacement? Or do you not want to do it this year because of the cost? And then that's, you know, that's up to you to decide. As Chris indicated, if bidders are coming in, they're expecting to be awarded the contract if their bid is the lowest responsible bid. You know, we're not just going out just to see, oh, is the engineer's estimate correct? You know, Rich Calby has, outside engineers doing estimates all the time for projects. Sometimes they are not, they aren't in line at all with what the engineer has said. It's usually a lot higher. But for the most part, I would say that the engineer's estimates are pretty accurate. So, you know, there's a one-off sometimes, there's supply chain issues, there's inflation, but, you know, for the most part, I, I think, and, you know, Rich, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that usually they're pretty close to what it's actually going to be. And so I think let, let's see if we can get that within the week and be able to get a new quote for the replacement and then bring that back next week and then have the council make a decision. And then the decision you have to keep in mind is that you're going to have to probably bond for $400,000 approximately. You know, if, it's, if this is accurate it, or if you decide to replace it, then it may be a million. You know, and I, it may not be. It may be only 500000 I don't know. We don't know. So, and again, there's no guarantee that the bids will come in like that. They may be less. As Council Member Reynolds said, they may be more. But um, at that point, at least, we'll know how you want to proceed. If you do want to proceed, we should also introduce a bond ordinance so that we have the funding available and we can award the contract. So that, that, those are the decisions I think you have to make. So you can think about this over the week till next week's meeting. Also, hopefully we can get an updated um, price or quote for the replacement and we'll bring that to you as well and then we can discuss it further. Chris, do you think it's realistic to be able to get an answer in a week? All I can do is ask. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I think um, Heather's recommendation is uh, a good path to follow, and, and we really have to seriously consider. I mean, we, 
You know, we're talking about we're talking about the bridge. We're talking about West Glen sidewalks, you know, and we are already at our maximum um, mm -hmm. bid capacity. Can always bid more, go out for for more bonding, but then that can put the village in a precarious position. So right. um, let's give this some thought. Chris, thank you so much. Okay. You're okay. All Just stay there if you would. So the next is a reallocation of capital funds for West Glen Avenue sidewalks. Um, what we did, because I know Councilmember Reynolds has recommended that the 500000 for Shedler that's been appropriated for this year possibly be reallocated to the West Glen Avenue sidewalks. Um, Mr. Rooney, Bob Rooney, our CFO, has checked with Bond Council, and they have indicated the way that it was written in the um, in the bond ordinance, it's actually vague enough that we could actually apply this to the sidewalks at the West Glen Avenue area without having to um, rename or re um, do it as a new category for the bond ordinance. So we could use the existing money, 500,000, towards West Glen without having to do anything further, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so I know that uh, Mr. Rutherford has some um, new ideas and some new um, plans possibly, or draft plans that he wants to discuss with you. Uh, yes. Um, we looked at our original design for West Glen sidewalk uh, involved a lot of retaining walls. Uh, reason being is there's a, considerably, a considerable amount of slopes for the properties in the eastbound direction. Some already have retaining walls. Some of those properties have cut in and developed their own parking spaces. Um, we looked to see if we could accommodate those. We could with retaining walls. Unfortunately, when we estimated that price with a re retaining wall block manufacturer, we were well over a million dollars. Um, that's quite expensive. Uh, we took another look at it, and we could put in a six-foot wide sidewalk from the curb immediately back six feet. Um, on other sections that we have done already, we've built a four-foot sidewalk with a parkway strip from the curb. Here, because we're going to put the sidewalk right against the curb, it has to be a little bit wider, according to Ashto, one of the standards we have to adhere to. Um, there will be grading. Uh, there will be landscaping that we'd have to do as part of this job. And um, there will be residents that will be losing their parking spaces. So there will be resident, residents upset with what's proposed. We're kind of used to that because the first phase of the sidewalk we did, we did have some upset residents that we had to deal with. Um, the Our estimate, very preliminary estimate for the work of the sidewalks on West Glen, and this would be only in the eastbound direction, continuing from where we had left off down to S Hill is in a neighborhood of 300,000. Uh, one thing that I have to stress for the council is that there are individuals that may desire or are desiring a sidewalk in the westbound direction, particularly uh, in the area where there's the open ditch. Uh, used to be 141 West Glen. The problem with that open ditch is that state open waters or waters of the United States, I believe. Um, I'm sorry, say that again? It's waters of the United States. If you look on a United States Geologic Survey map, it's shown as a blue line. In the engineering development world, if you see that, you've got an established water body. Um, you all may look at that ditch and say, what the heck are you talking about? And I would agree with you um, because I'm going to digress a little bit. There's a pipe at the west end. It opens up into the ditch. There's a pipe that comes from the north, drains through the properties that were developed into the ditch. And then at the very east end of the properties that were developed, that ditch goes into a pipe. I had proposed piping that section. DEP told me, no way. So putting a sidewalk there in there on top of that ditch area it would be an extremely difficult endeavor. We'd have to look at stream encroachment, uh, repairing buffer encroachment. We could not pipe the ditch as much as I or anyone else would like to. So that section will be, once we're finished on West Glen, 
will remain without sidewalk, unfortunately, for those residents. Can I ask you a question about sure. that area? So the people that have the new house that was built, they have a driveway. They have two, yes. The and two the new driveways houses. go over the ditch. Uh, they have culverts, correct. So how is that allowed? They went through the permitting process. Okay. It's a, they were allowed to do that. One of the reasons was the previous home that had been there had that type of access. Okay. But so when I asked about putting the entire area because the sidewalk would run along the entire frontage, piping it, I was told not, not very good chance. So let me ask you then, because there is a decent, if you look at um, the pictures that we got, it's kind of the first picture mm -hmm. on the top left. Mm -hmm. This is this is the driveway that goes over the ditch. So these people come out their driveway and if they wanted to walk left, there's a, a decent amount of space there, but the rocks are so, it, it's treacherous to walk on. Is yeah. there any way we could just remove the rocks and flatten that area and put mulch down? So that um, there's like a walking path, not mulch, necessarily a Mulch sidewalk. would disappear in the first rainstorm. Say that again? Uh, mulch would disappear in the first rain event. Uh, while it looks very innocuous when there's no rain, it does get a lot, it has a considerable drainage area feeding to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the pipe downstream, I think, is 30 or 36 inch in diameter. Chris, what uh, about gravel? Pardon? Gravel. That watches away very quickly. Once you hit scour velocity, it goes bye-bye. I, I, I think the question is, is there some substance that, as Lorraine recommended, we could um, put down to, cr to create a path that is less expensive than uh, and, and less uh, uh, requiring of, of a permit um, other than concrete? That Just we could something put down. you could walk something, on, because exactly. you really can't walk on this. Like, I was afraid no, it's I was a stream bank. turn my ankle, so we ended up walking in the street here, because it really yeah. was unsafe. It, it is a stream bank. It is within the riparian buffer. Um, all those items would have to be addressed to the DEP satisfaction. Okay. Whatever, whatever material is proposed, um, like I said, wood chips or gravel, those will wash away quite quickly. Uh, the boulders you see there, they've managed to stay in place because they're heavy and s enough to not be moved by the floodwaters or heavy rain. Let me also ask you a question. The, that really funky in intersection where there's S Hill, the two sides of Heights, um, the, the crosswalk between, uh, I guess on Heights on the, I think it's the southbound side, I'm not good with directions. Mm -hmm. Is it the the area of Glen where you want to do the sidewalks, finish them? Is that the southbound side? Um, I prefer to say that's the eastbound direction the of eastbound Glen. The eastbound direction. But it is the south side of the roadway. Right. Okay. So you're correct. Sort of right. Some okay. Words. As you're coming, so if you're coming down from Monroe. Yes. On the south side you want to, you've only done the sidewalks maybe the first couple of houses, and then it just yes, ends. Yes, we've already done those. Okay. We did the easy stuff. Okay, right. So where it ends, then you want to continue it down to S Hill? Correct. Okay. That would be our intention. So the question I have is where S Hill is, there seems to be a big site obstruction. If you're coming down S Hill and you wanted to make a left, Mm -hmm. You really can't see. There is a, there are a couple of trees in that corner piece, in that like triangular corner piece, that will be removed to do the sidewalk. Work. Okay, so that would be very helpful. That was a question, but then also on heights on that same south side of the street, the street is so wide. It was there ever any talk of narrowing? You know, with bump outs. So a crosswalk isn't 40 feet wide? Um, we've not had any requests for a bump out. Uh, you are correct. It is a lot of asphalt real estate. Um, we have put roads on what is called a road diet elsewhere in the village. Uh, it's certainly something we can consider 
when it's time to resurface that portion of Heights. Oh, like what you did at South Irving, like the lines in the to make it look narrow. What, uh, what no, the best about? example we did on a road diet is Grove Street as it approaches the Saddle River. Okay. Uh, the road there was extremely wide, and motorists coming from Paramus, where it's two lanes, came into Ridgewood, where it was very wide and slowly necked to one lane. There was a lot of motorist confusion because they went way too fast. Our speed limit is 25. The one in Paramus, I believe, is 35. So what we did there is we created that landscape island, mm -hmm. reduced the roadway width, put a bike lane in, and that right. has helped significantly on the speeds in that location. Because the police department had one of their favorite, I don't know if it was their favorite, but they had a nice radar trap <laughs> right on the area of Grove Street adjacent to the right. county park. Okay. So Glen is a county road, correct? Yes, it is. Would the county give us any money for safety improvements if we wanted to um, do bump outs? I could ask, but I doubt it. Okay. Well, if you could ask, that would be great. Because um, also, wouldn't the bump outs encourage cars to go slower? Uh, they should. I, okay. um, they... The bump outs do generally encourage cars to go slower because they don't ha have the luxury of so much real estate to maneuver in. They have to be right. more attentive to their maneuvering. Same reason why we put double yellow lines in at times, because it narrows the perceived field to the motorist's eye, so that they sometimes subconsciously slow down, resulting in what the action we want. Mm -hmm. So on the eastbound side, no westbound side that you've already done how much feet of grass do you have before the four feet of sidewalk I believe the parkway strip is around 18 inches or so I don't have that exactly okay. in my mind so it's almost about six feet which is what you're proposing yeah. for it, the other side just all sidewalk no yeah. grass but the parkway strip we have in the westbound direction while it is green I strongly strongly do not recommend planting any trees in it because it's it's a very narrow piece right and it would be a site obstruction as well uh, Eventually, probably yes. after you know many years mm -hmm. but if you have the six feet why couldn't you do a parkway strip and four foot of sidewalk we're we're worried about how those residents that their parking spaces are going to park their vehicles um, we think they may be parking on the sidewalk when we're done. Not to say that they are, but human nature being what it is. And plus, we also need to look carefully with the existing retaining walls and existing slopes over there. Okay. And so if you did no retain where there is no retaining wall and you did six feet of sidewalk, then would it just, their grass would just go up? You know, uh, like we one, would, of, that's, one of those things? We're going to have to look carefully. We're going to have to slope that up. We estimate, we, in our estimate, we have some Belgian block. We may have to put a small curb on the inside of the sidewalk to help with the vertical difference. Okay. And do you think it would hold up, after, you know, rainstorm after rainstorm? We're going to have to see about that because it is two-to-one slope, and that's usually a little bit steeper than most people are comfortable in mowing. Right. So we may have to look at landscaping with Pachysandra or some other ground cover that doesn't need as intensive care as a lawn would with mowing. Okay. So if you had the 500,000 and the eastbound side is going to be 300, could we? That's our, prelimin that's our preliminary estimate. Okay. Can, Chris, right. can, can we pass the plans that you have, the new ones? Um, I'm going to finalize it. This is a working drawing that okay. we have. It doesn't even have a title block on it. Okay. And if you open it up, it goes out, comes out to about four feet by six feet. Okay. So while we're talking about sidewalks, do you have any idea what sidewalks would be on the westbound side from Maple to Oak? It's not that much of a span. It's not that much of a horizontal distance, but there is considerable vertical. Uh, a number of those properties rise pretty quickly up from the curb line. Um, we have to take a look at that. Uh, I heard a public comment tonight about making it accessible for the disabled. 
that may add additional challenges because there are specified slopes to make it disabled accessible. You know, generally one in 12, after 12 or 15 feet, you have to have, to have a landing. Um, best example of that, if you want to see it, is the sidewalk between Village Hall and the library that arcs from the parking lot up to Maple Avenue. Okay. That's a pretty steep slope. Yeah. Yes, there's also landings there. And there's retaining walls. Okay. So, and that, okay. those add cost to a mere sidewalk installation. Okay. And how does it work for the folks that are going to lose parking spots? Pardon? For the folks that are going to lose parking spots if we were to do um, the eastbound side, how does that work? Do those folks have a legal right? There's an eminent domain? I mean, what concern? I'm just well, it's, concerned about additional it's costs. It's the public right of way. They've had a very good benefit of that public right of way. Mm -hmm. um, and if we go forward with what we're proposing to do, they may lose that benefit. Okay. So could I just say a couple things because the public's still here. Um, so obviously, I, I want to start out with that I grew up in Ridgewood. I used to work at Sicilian Sun. I used to commute via West, West Glen to get from my location to there. No one is denying that it is a dangerous road. I think no one would deny that there's very few conduits that go from west to east. And not only do we have commuter traffic from the west side into the city, but we have student traffic that commutes there as well. So to the, the Glen residents, I really appreciate all the outreach being new here. I think Evan does as well. I also want to talk about what's gone here. So first, I want you to understand we all recognize the danger, and I have some details with that. But since being on the council, we haven't seen the new plan. And during the capital budget, you know, we were given information, and there was no information on the detail of this project. Lorraine is the CSAC rep. I'm not pointing fingers. We've had a good dialogue on this. And when we saw it, we removed it from the budget, not on the merits of the project, well, I didn't, but simply on the dollar amount, that it was a million-dollar ask, and we were like, wow. Because as Paul said, while we have our operating budget and we're capped by a percentage there, we have a threshold of $7.5 million. And because, not in a mean way, there was no advocacy for this to new council members, I certainly felt like the million dollars had to go to get under the $7 million. So just because you're here and we're all neighbors, I want to make sure I explain my position. So capital, we do have a threshold. So we want to make sure we go under $7.5 million. And during the budgeting process, there was, for me, being new, no information, no plan, and no advocacy for that. Uh, so I feel for you with the danger, and I want everyone to understand financially that was the only driver, I think, for all of us. I'll let all of you speak to that. Um, we all are given committees, and we all advocate for our committees differently. Lorraine and I have since partnered on this, which I'll talk about. We've looked at some of the financials. Um, the, with that, we need to make sure that all of us who are new, that we talk and we hear about CSEC, which is what we're doing now. But I did go back and look at the past improvements, and I was shocked, because to date, the prior council only spent just shy of $100,000. And that's a big jump. You know, 100 to a million is a lot, just outside of the issue, the financials. So at that point, it seemed like there has to be a cost reduction. I also believe that the plan that we were verbally told ended even before it got to Oak Street. It still was the sidewalk that ended to nowhere with the million dollars, meaning it went to the train trestle and it just stopped. And I was like, well, that seems kind of weird as well. So with this, I do believe there are efficiencies. I believe that you know neighbors can make compromises. I, too, don't have sidewalks, and we have a right-of-way issue all the time. My neighbor has a fire hydrant on their lawn. And I think there is a lot we can do in modifying the design, moving the bulk of the retaining wall, and getting into the details. And I think we need to, as a council, take Lorraine and whoever you choose and go back and forth with the neighbors and see which elements we can move at a lower cost and keep this project chugging. The other thing that I want to highlight is that um, when I walked it and I also drove with my student driver, who is now a fully licensed driver, by the way, it is um, the crosswalks are too long. Longer crosswalks in general yield, yield more pedestrian strikes. They're more dangerous. In town, you'll see the clock in town. When I was younger, that was one one really long crosswalk that was really dangerous. So the shorter the crosswalk, the better. And I don't believe it's just a sidewalk issue that we can do some traffic calming. So 
That being said, you know, I'm a very tactile person. I, what I want the public who's advocated this to understand, this was solely a financial decision that for at least for me being new here, I had no detail. Being very technical, this is stressing me out because I can't see that. So I don't even know what we're talking about. But I would, I would love to see the project move forward in a smaller increment, you know, get some of it down and then talk about where we can shift some of the money from. Um, I think that seems to be the most reasonable thing to do. I also think there was one neighbor when I went back through public comment, but I've understood he's moved, who was not a fan of this, so I think that's advantageous. But I think if we can continue to keep the project alive and be mindful that to go from $100,000 over the course of five years to a million is like enormous and not sustainable to the general taxpayer, I think we could have a plan. And I also think, Lorraine, with the sidewalks, we need to talk about the awkward intersection of making a no left turn at the end of S Hill. I mean, that's like a crazy place to make a left hand turn. It's absolutely crazy, um, especially icy, and then shortening those sidewalks. I mean, I would be willing to help you if you wanted me to help. No, but what I'm saying is, I believe we have to make a decision on this by tomorrow. I think that we can reallocate the money now by tomorrow. After tomorrow, we can't. I, I, is that true? Right. You, don't, you actually don't have to reallocate it. It can right. be used as is. Exactly. It's just that you have to come to an agreement that you want to use either all the 500000 or part of the 500000 towards this other side of West Glen. That's all. So wait, before we go to the money, which we can get back to, does anybody, is, not that it needs, is what I said, does that make sense? I mean, are we all in agreement sort of that the reason why we cut it was funding and not... I mean, anybody else want to say anything and then we can talk? I never funding. wanted to cut it. No, right I, from day one, I was against cutting it. And I don't want to fight. I always I, say I that. Mean, but there was, no, there was no advocacy for it from <laughs> you as the chair when we removed it from the budget. And it's okay. It was a, That's it was, not true. I mean, Siobhan, I, I, I have you're, you're, said a million times, take the, including all the budget hearings, don't put that extra 500000 into Shedler. Put it into the Glen sidewalks. But we're, okay. we're, but I think, we Siobhan, to... well, Siobhan, I think you're absolutely right. Go ahead. Um, we were presented with a million-dollar line item with zero information behind no it. No advocacy. And in a, budget, in a budget situation where we're looking to have to furlough potential, you know, for potentially furlough employees, it was an easy pitch given that I certainly was like Siobhan, had not heard of this issue until after the budget hearings were held when a lot of citizens came forward with some very, very good points. And tonight, for the first time, I'm hearing, well, maybe we can do it for 300000 or 400000 That's a very different conversation from a million dollars. And had we had that information, I'm not saying it had to come from you, Lorraine, or from CSAC or from wherever, we might have revisited, reviewed it and, and come up with a different, um, a different outcome. I don't think we should be making decisions now without actual numbers about what may potentially happen with a deadline of tomorrow. That, to me, is really foolish. I mean, I, I, if there's a way to get a real, uh, a, uh, a real number out there and be able to do all the due diligence of the homework that, that this project deserves and get it done this year. We should absolutely do that. But I think to then just say, well, let's just take money from here from there and hope it works out, that's, that's not right. And I agree with Siobhan. I really wish the last information had come from CSAC or elsewhere prior to the literally less than 24 hours before the budget vote um, because all we were presented with, here's a million dollars and there's no real information behind it and it used to be 100,000, now it's a million. And by the way, you've got a huge hole in your budget because you know, we're not getting any more, um, any more COVID money and the previous council didn't really fund this. So it's very easy to say we'll put it off to next year when hopefully we'll be in better times. I, I do want to say on a positive note, because before it gets to, it's a good thing, this discussion. It's a good thing. And I just want to make sure tonight before we go to, and we can have the funding discussion as well, there's a group of concerned residents that should be dealt with in blocks so they don't need to individually advocate for us. You know, there's a, almost a neighborhood group. That's what I would say. That's sort of, you, you see the addresses. They should be kept in the loop. We, we talked about, you know, designs and how neighbors, we can enter when we have an updated, we should disclose the designs and the price on the West Glen project tab. And we should talk about that. I also want to add that during the campaign, I learned that um, Richwood has 13 county roads running through it. And we need to talk about how we're interfacing with the county. We have more county roads than any other town in Bergen County and Richwood. Just fun fact. And Franklin and the advocacy for the lights and this, we haven't gotten our lion's share from Bergen County. So I think if we're all in agreement that West Glen has the opportunity to become safer and we all rally around that, 
and it's a question of cost, and because it's linear, you know, these are sidewalks, we could take them in smaller buckets and start to chip away at it each year. And how we do that, you know, I don't want to become inefficient and do six, six sections and then six, but the, the previous spend before this council assembled was $98,000. That is a big jump and a big commitment from a brand new council without, and, and I agree with Evan, we need to see the details. Um, so those are my thoughts. I, again, I'm not the CSAC rep, I'm not on safety. This is a flaw of mine. I'd be willing to help. I'd be willing to run point with some of it, but we need, we need more details. We need more costs to figure out how we're doing this. As Chris said, they did the easy part. That's why it was 100,000. Right. Now it's the hard part. It's going to cost more money. Agreed. I'm just saying this because we have neighbors here, and I've gotten letters that we've pulled money. And I, I, look, we have. Again, again. Excuse I want me. To I'm going to jump in because I have some questions, and I know you guys have to go back and forth. So, um, Chris, we're talking. The original proposal in the capital project was for the was for sidewalks on the east side of, excuse me, the eastbound side of Glen, correct? Yes. Okay, because now we, we also brought the westbound side in, but that was never part of the... Well, the only reason I mentioned the westbound side is there are residents that are asking for that, and I wanted to explain to the council that that's an extremely, extremely difficult ask to Got address. It. Got it. I just want to make sure that that was the original proposal. So, and so Paul, just on clarification, that ended before you got to Oak Street, yes? Got it. The million dollar one. So, well, we've gone to Oak Street. We have sidewalks to Oak Street on the eastbound direction. We built those five, six years ago. Let me continue with my questions for just okay. a moment so I can right. just keep a train of thought going. So what is the, what, what was the proposed length of sidewalk that we were putting in with that million dollar proposal? That, the length of that section was, I believe, let me see. Around 1,300 feet. 1,300 feet. And, and by removing the retaining wall, we saved 70% on, on the cost of this job. Our, our estimates working with a manufacturer for the retaining wall, the wall box themselves installed was 970,110. And just for the retaining just wall. For the retaining just wall. for the retaining so wall. So you can do. 1,300 feet of sidewalk you estimate for $300,000. Again, yes, because we're going to be grading, a um, little bit of landscaping technique, uh, and it's going to be just in from the sidewalk, uh, in from the curb. Okay, give me just a second. Okay, so, and the parking spaces on the eastbound side, they, we were going to lose them, correct? When you put this, when you put the sidewalk in with the retaining wall. No, we were actually preserving them. Ah. Okay. That's one of the reasons. You know, we looked at it. Uh, the first design we did with the retaining walls. The intent is to not make too much of an encumbrance on those properties that we're going to be working on. Preserve their parking spaces. Um, it's a very expensive preserve their parking space. So we took a look at it, and that's where we are with a $300,000 number because we're not going to preserve any of their parking spaces. They'll have their driveway access, but they're not going to be able to park parallel Got to it. the roadway. So in, in some back-of-the-envelope math, if, if 1,300 feet of sidewalk cost $300,000, you could do somewhere between a little over 400 feet of sidewalk with a hundred thousand dollars, is that accurate, or does that not work? It depends what is involved. Just putting in the sidewalk, certainly less. Retaining walls, grading, excavation. Just the sidewalk. Uh, sidewalk. Our current estimate on sidewalk, four inches thick, is about seventy dollars a square yard. Our current bids are indicating it's closer to maybe seventy-eight, eighty dollars a square yard. And in term, but in terms of linear feet, you said thirteen hundred linear feet would cost about $300,000. So I'm saying for $100,000, you could get a little over 400 linear feet of sidewalk, according to that. If we're working up in this location, mm -hmm. we'd have to, we, will, we would just continue where we left off 
and go as far as we could to any funds available. Right. I mean, for example, if you look where the sidewalk stop, um, just east where the sidewalk ends, about five, six feet east, there's a tree. If we continue, we remove the tree, and then the next property also has a fence in the way. So we'd have to relocate that. Got it. And those and, are the things we have to work our way down along the street. And what I'm thinking, and someone tell me where I'm off base on this, is, you know, I heard a recommendation about let's keep this project moving. And certainly I think we all agree it's something we would like to do, and only because, again, in a, in a community of seemingly unlimited resources, we have limited resources. But if we put in, again, say 400 or so feet of, of sidewalk with no retaining wall, um, I could see my way clear to reallocating $100,000 to do that and to keep this project moving and to get it moving further than it has moved in a very long time. That's very much the story of this project because we've done the other section of sidewalks that we have completed were done over a number of years. I think it was two, maybe three different uh, projects. Right, and, and to, to Siobhan's point, when we were presented with um, close to $12 million in capital projects and we knew we had a limit of 7.5 million. Um, this was, this was a, it was a big number given what had been spent on it in the past. And it's not that it was not necessary, it was completely necessary. It's that the choices are hard when there are limited resources. Um, what does the council and Chris and Heather, um, your thoughts on reallocating $100,000 to see if we can put in about 400 feet or so of sidewalk or as far as that $100,000 will take us. My it's only not question help is the neighbors whatsoever 400 mm -hmm. feet. Right, I, that's what I was going to say. I don't know how far that's going to go. Is it going to go one house for 400 feet or is it going to go two? No, it'll be it'll, like it'll cover several of the houses at the more westerly end where we had stopped. Okay. And, we're, talking and, about a, we're talking about a third of the entire project. So when we say one house, well, if it was one house, then we're talking about three houses with 1,300 so about, feet, which okay. it's not. So it's about three houses, three or four houses. So I, my question, my question is me. bidding out 400 feet of sidewalk, is that, are we going to get a good bid or are we going to get a better bid if we bid out more? Um, I wouldn't bid it out. I would just give it as a change order or, uh, to or excuse me, an additional award to our paving contractors. I see because they have sidewalk in their paving mm -hmm. bids. We already know what the prices are. So you know, what I would recommend is just an additional award. Okay. That's, that's how we have done other sections of the sidewalk. And, and my thought is that every year is a tough year. The big numbers are harder to keep in the budget, but if it was done over, let's say, a three-year period, then it gets done in three years, as opposed to the number is so big that it is not sustainable in any given year. And so this is a down payment on this and it, it gets it started and then perhaps next year maybe there's enough to finish it or maybe there's enough to put another hundred thousand dollars towards this because it's a it's a project that we would like to complete and keep and as as one resident said, keep moving. We have the five hundred thousand to reallocate. We, we have a, and, and again, we can go back and forth on this right. all night, so let's, let's, let's right. not because. Let's just face it. Chadler is more important than safety. No. That's what you're saying. No. Um, Bottom that is line. A, that is, excuse me, excuse me, that is, that is a project that has languished for 14 years, and we have an opportunity to complete it. And so no, there, you don't. Nothing is going me, to happen in 2023. I, I don't Finish. interrupt you. That's it. That's a project that we have an that we have an opportunity to complete, and it has been languishing for 14 years. So, we are making choices. We disagree on the choice. I am trying to get some of this project done, and some is a third is not a tenth. A third is a significant amount. It this has not been done in for many years, 
I don't know how many, but there's never been a sidewalk there in the 30 years that I've lived in Ridgewood. If we were to pursue this plan, if it worked out, it could be done in two to three years. Doesn't seem completely unreasonable to me. Did you, have you been there? Have you gotten out of your car and walked that? I have. Listen, I, I think everyone agrees this needs to get done. Excuse I don't me, you interrupted me. If we did 400 feet of sidewalk, it would be a sidewalk to nowhere. It wouldn't help anybody. We have the 500,000. In 2023, at the rate we're going, we're going to be under lawsuits with Shedler. We are not going to get anything done at Shedler this year. If we bond that 500000 for Shedler, the residents of Ridgewood are going to be paying on that bond where the money is not going to be used. Let's use it in 2023 for the sidewalks. And then, like you said, next year we'll have more money. We'll put it to Shedler. Because this year we're going to be in lawsuits with Shedler. Nothing's going to happen. But could, could I say, I, I, could I say I two things? I disagree with your assessment. I just want to go back to the, oh, no, no, the, I want to go back. Okay, go ahead. Evan. <laughs> I mean, listen, you know, we have, I think it's a little disingenuous here to be trying to pick on Shedler. There's lots of money that we're spending this year on lots of different things. You just happen to not like Shedler, so that's where you're saying we should pull this from. You're talking about apples and oranges. The fact is, this should have been done. This should have been done for years. I would ask you, as a chair of CSAC, when you had $2 million of COVID money for the last years, why was it not finished last year or the year before? This project's been languishing forever. Why is it only now that we're advocating hearing new numbers like the day before we're supposed to vote on this thing? To try to you know, somehow gain some political ground by trying to rile up the people that are in a different viewpoint on Shedler in order to support this is just disingenuous and it's not true. We Excuse all me. want this project done. But let's talk about actual ways of getting things done. Let's actually talk about ways we can help the people there instead of trying to, instead of trying to just you know, make political points. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying it's a waste of money not to use it in the year that you bond it. You are not going to use that money on Shedler this year. Okay, so you already have $1.9 million in Shedler that has been bonded that the residents of Ridgewood are paying for. I have not heard about this new sidewalk plan except for Siobhan. It was about two weeks ago, whatever. I didn't, if I knew about it, obviously I would have brought it up at the budget meetings. But I didn't know. I didn't know there was another option. I thought that the retaining walls was the only option. Now that we know there are other options and we can finish it, let's finish it this year. Let's do it. So, so I just want to say a couple positive things. First of all, I think it's so nobody gets mad. These questions that the new members have asked is good. I mean, the bulk of the cost was in the retaining law, and I feel lucky that I pressed the issue. I think that's good. With respect to the, the capital fight that's going on here, I want to talk about my perspective of the budget meeting. We also cut a million dollars of garbage trucks that Sean Hamlin has asked for several years. And I want to talk about that because our DPW through COVID worked, and that was, for me, incredibly hard. And, you know, balancing budget you know, what we're going to do, and the reason we, why we cut that is because you can't buy one garbage truck, you have to buy two, because in case one fails. Um, and I felt, and I think the whole council felt badly about that. So when you take away like $8 million, you feel badly about that. Again, not having the full scope to this, I do agree this project needs to move forward. I don't know if $100,000 is enough, and I think we could, you know, maybe we want to look in more detail. I am committed to doing work on West Glen this year when the scope is further defined. I also um, want to say things. Shedler, and I'm not taking aim at you guys, you have been pumping capital money in there with no return for five years. One of the things that led me to, as a citizen, to get involved was the incessant bonding with no return. There is going to be something at Shedler because they're the house according to what everyone's told me, will be ready by June. Last night at the open space meeting, the Shedler people and the open space, everyone was talking about possibly having celebration. We can't build a $2.6 million house and have no way to access it. We want the Shedler neighbors to walk. We want the Glen neighbors to walk. The other thing that also came out of the budget, and we've added additional funds to Shedler, and everybody just thinks, because we've sort of taken the whole conversation to the, the field, we could be pumping more trees into Shedler. 
We could be doing things with this. It's very unfair to pick capital against capital, but the house, no matter what happens, better be finished pretty soon. The return on capital is stunning to me that Shadler would be mentioned because while citizens, myself including, were demanding a status, more and more capital sat there. It's, it's going to benefit people. We should not pit capital against capital. I think split, agreeing Glenn is important and then deciding how much and when is something we should do. One of the things that I also think we should talk about is the Board of Ed's going through the budget. This is a safe walkway to rule, or to school. Maybe they could help here. There's student traffic there. We have not explored alternative sources of revenue. We haven't partnered with the county. And you guys know this, how much, I don't even have a design to talk about. Um, so personally, I think we, we are committed to the project and we should decide what percentage based on the efficiencies from the engineering and move a percentage of it forward. Keep in mind that in, I asked for the bonding back to 2016. $98,000 is spent to date. It's not so bad for us to double or triple that, but 10 times we just don't have. And five times seems a lot too. And I just really want to say this. Shedler is a park, there is a house. That house is going to be done and we are going to need to get people there. The people want, you know, last night's meeting, Pam was there, people were talking about having a celebration for when it opens. How are we gonna do that if we can't get anybody there? So that's it, I hope that makes sense. I feel bad for the West Glen people. I hope you understand the budgeting process and that we really just didn't know the scope and I do applaud the neighborhood for reaching out and the percentage that will be done this year will be, in my opinion, greater than what's been done in all the years past. And, and I also wanna say that Siobhan is the one who pressed the idea of doing this without a retaining wall, which changed the number completely. So um, I appreciate that. And I, and I have a question, Heather. Um, because the money is allocated in capital now, we don't actually have to make a decision tonight because it's there. We can determine where to put it later, correct? Right, but you know, if you want Chris to go further with these plans and we make can, them actual what I'm saying plans. is we can do that. We don't have to make the decision tonight and because we're adopting tomorrow. And right. if we chose to, we could even put out a special bond ordinance for 100000 or some amount of money after sure. that. So you, you could do that if so you wanted to. Our deadline is really not a deadline. It's, it's just to be able to say that this is how you want to allocate the money. But again, because of the way it was written, that 500000 you could use all of it, you could use some of it towards West Glen. So Siobhan's thoughts about, about having Chris put up detailed plans that we can look at and perhaps if, if the council were inclined to look at a partial completion of this sidewalk. And again, bearing in mind that the last time any money was spent on this was seven years ago. Had they spent $100,000 a year on this, it would have been done four years ago. So again, just putting this into some perspective to get this done as opposed to making choices that we can argue about all night. I would support con uh, partial construction of the West Glen sidewalk. And while we're contemplating what action to take, um, as a resident suggested, can we check and make sure that there are a sufficient number of speed limit signs on West Glen? I don't think any amount of speed limit sign are gonna help. Sidewalks help calm, it, it's a calming, you know, method. It's, it's well known. When you put sidewalks in, it's a speed calming event. When you put, you know, islands in the middle of a road, that's because, a speed Because it calming. narrows the street. Yes, yeah. anytime and, you and narrow however, the However, the, the cost of, the, a, of a sign is, is there's no, right, there's no downside to doing it. If that. they're not there, then yeah. what, what are we, what are we doing? I mean, they are there, aren't they? Lorraine, there's efficiencies. I think we've built it. We should look at the no left-hand turn. Yeah, the no, I agree. We should, so it. look, at, we are all taking this very seriously. I went there, walked the dog, and it, try driving it with a teenage driver. It is a hazardous road. We can talk about enforcement, but there's things that we can do. The other thing is with the funding, who, the Board of Ed rep, do you want to bring this up with the Board of Ed to see if they can give us any capital? 
I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting this a, is a safe walkway to school, a, and an we do talk about face a, from a board of ed. Uh, no, I, I um, still think member. it's an additional source of funding. It's a valid point. You know, we hear consistently from the, the school age children. I mean, Robin, the kids. You know, the, the school has a responsibility too. If we can get other sources of funding and we get all hands on the table, and we agree it's important, we can just increase the percentage that we do this year. Mm -hmm. May I recommend, since there actually is no deadline tomorrow. Um, I want to I want to confirm that with Bob because I I thought there was. Uh, Chris, could you draw us up some detailed plans that we can look at for next week's meeting that show us what this sidewalk would look like without retaining walls? What you estimate every hundred thousand dollars would give us in terms of the total completion of this sidewalk? Uh, very maybe. How maybe? <laughs> very, very maybe. maybe. Right now, like for example, today, Yovan, our CAD designer, he was laying out the striping on Prospect Street. Then perhaps in two weeks. It may be four weeks. Yeah, four weeks. Right. When when you can, as soon as you reasonably can, okay. because I think I think everyone on this day has walked in here, um, hoping we could find a way to get this done. And we're looking, we're looking for ways to do it. I have a thought that's on the table. Maybe it's popular, maybe it's not. I will tell you that in two to three years, it would mean that it's done, and perhaps in two. So it is, it is just a thought, as, um, and, it, and, and if it was done in two years, it's more than the, what's been done in the last seven. So um, you know, the, the all or nothing approach there's, there's a lot of things out there that this village needs. I mean, here, we just talked about four or $500,000 for a bridge that has not been in use for the last couple of years that we hear from residents, not quite at every meeting, but regularly. And so we have very, I, I, I wish we had all the money that we wanted so that we could do all the projects that must be done. So. But this one does create a hazard, and I think everyone recognizes that. So, Chris, if you could, if, if, it's, if it's agreeable with the council, if you could, as soon as you can, come back to us and give us some idea. Um, and that would be without the retaining walls, correct? Without right. the retaining right. walls. Chris, can I ask you, I thought you already had a plan without the retaining walls. Isn't that what's in front of you? It's what? It's a working drawing. I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my next question is, last year, do you have an approximate linear footage of sidewalks that you guys did? I'd have to look into what we did. Okay. Because it, it was a lot, in my opinion. Uh, we've done, like I said, we've done sidewalk at least two, maybe three times with our paving contractors over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we got done what we had. Right. Okay. I would really like to give a commitment to the residents that we are going to do more than 400 linear feet. I mean, it really, like I said, that would be a sidewalk to nowhere. It wouldn't help them. They need help. It's, it's very dangerous, and 400 feet wouldn't, it wouldn't stop the kids from walking in the street. A and it, there's just no connection. We need to have the connection, at least on one side. We all good? Thank you so much, Chris. You're welcome. Okay. Just, you may as well stay because you have other yeah. things. <laughs> um, the next one is the um, insecticide um, that we're injecting into the emerald ash borer um, ash trees. So, um, to date, we've taken 107 large ash trees have been removed through an outside contractor, and 256 ash trees have been removed through shade tree. Um, the village initially treated 173 ash trees, and a second treatment is recommended at this time. They went out for uh, rec uh, parks and recreation went out for three quotes from individual vendors. 
for these 173 trees. The recommendation is to award the contract to Bartlett Tree Experts of Waldwick, New Jersey, at a price not to exceed $13,446, and funding is through the capital budget. Questions, anyone? Yes. Um, on the 173 trees that were treated, they all survived? Yes. So that's very good news. Do we think that, you know, there's a good hope that they are going to continue to survive? We're cautiously, we are cautiously optimistic that, like any medication, this takes or works successfully. Well, if they all survived, why is the number 161 that Bartlett's quoting? That I don't, I don't know. I did not prepare the bid. My guess is some of them died. It might be. I, I, I was told it was 173. I, I don't know. I will find out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next one is sewer fees for significant sewer dischargers. We charge a fee structure based upon equivalent dwelling units for commercial, industrial, minor and significant discharges to the sanitary sewer collection system. Nonprofit and tax exempt properties are billed for the sewage treatment services they receive. The 2022 rate was $4.45 per thousand gallons of flow in excess of 109,500 gallons per year discharge from commercial properties. And then, and this is measured during the um, water meter consumption during the two winter quarters. Nonprofits are billed from the first gallon of water they consume. After examining operating costs, cost of living increase uh, rate, Mr. Rutherford is recommending the 2023 rate be increased to $4.70 per thousand gallons. And um, just want to start out by saying, um, I don't think I absolutely need to recuse myself in this matter, um, but I am going to because I am a, um, I have a business that is a significant discharger, so. Okay, so are there any questions or comments? No. Okay, the next one is award of a sole source contract. This is um, two Lucas devices, accessories, batteries, and an additional carrying case. A Lucas device is a mechanical chest compression device used to provide chest compressions and CPR, provides continuous, consistent compressions to patients and cardiac arrest. Not only does this improve care to the patient, it has greatly reduced injuries to first responders, especially during transport. Um, the two Lucas devices that will be replaced are at the end of their life. It's awarding a sole source contract to Stryker Medical of Chicago, Illinois, not to exceed $34,971.72. Funding is in the capital budget for the fire department. So I, I have a question. It's a random question. Um, one of, in January, and I don't have the data, I apologize. We, didn't we just bond for a Lucas device in January? That's what this purchase okay. is. Yeah. So this is to execute it after the bond's been approved. Right, this is because like we, have we, have to, we have to approve the bond ordinance. It has to be effective, and then we award the contract okay. on that. And, so the, and we're getting two in the case of one fails? Both, the other two are both at the end of their life. So that's why it was two. Okay, but we always have two? It's like, one of, it's like the garbage can thing. We can't work with just one? No, I think it's for different areas. Right, location. exactly. Okay, those were my only questions. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, the next one is award contract under state contract for tires. Um, this is to Hudson Tire Exchange of Hackensack, New Jersey, and Custom Bandag of Linden, New Jersey. Uh, not to exceed $80,000. Funding is in the Fleet Services operating budget. Questions? The next one is award of a contract under state contract for um, bulletproof vests um, and other law enforcement personnel items to Lawman Supply of New Jersey, of Pensacola, New Jersey, not to exceed $75,000. Funding is through the police capital budget and from a grant. Everyone good? Mm -hmm. The next one is awarding a contract for the first year of a three-year contract under source wealth cooperative purchasing for the leasing and maintenance of six administrative detective and traffic van vehicles through Enterprise Fleet Management Inc. of Wayne, New Jersey, 
not to exceed $130,000. Funding is in the police department operating account. So are these um, specially equipped vehicles or not? Their administrative vehicles are like the chief's vehicle, the captain's vehicles, the, the van, which we have the safety van. Um, and especially this, equipped how? Yes, they have lights. They have not on top, but inside. A special suspension and all of that. Yes, correct. They're police vehicles. Okay. And uh, uh, is, this a, is this an ongoing lease? Is this We've been doing this for, gosh, six years, five years, maybe. So it's not a new lease? This, this one is. It's the first year of a three-year contract. It says continuation because they've been doing it for many years. Okay, then my question is, mm -hmm. um, was there any exploration of whether hybrid vehicles could be used or leased? I don't know. I can ask. Because I think we should be doing that on a regular basis. If they're available. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No. Nope. Okay. The next one is award the second year of a two-year contract for a service contract under the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance for current CCTV, access control, automatic license plate readers, and the panic alarm system to secure Watch 24 of Moonaki, New Jersey, not to exceed $50,726 for the two-year contract. But this is year two. Um, funding is from the police operating budget. In addition, a contract for Genetech Licensing fees, which covers all of the doors, cameras on the network, including the parking garage and water department buildings, not to exceed $7,390.28. And again, it's funded from the police operating budget. Everybody good? Okay. The next one is the rebid of the um, coffee bar at the Ridge Ridgewood train station. This was the second time that we went out to bid for this. Um, there were no bids received, um, so there was a resolution to acknowledge the receipt that no bids were received and to permit the village to negotiate for a prospective concession operator. Um, the intent of the bid was to obtain a vendor to operate a concession stand at the train station as was done before the pandemic. Any questions? Bring, bring on the coffee, Heather. Good luck. <laughs> Okay, the next one is um, short-term rentals um, of pickup trucks. So this is awarding a contract under the source well contract to United Rentals of Ridgefield Park, New Jersey, not to exceed 28,000. Um, this allows the police department to rent two pickup trucks to be used for construction details. It also covers any maintenance issues. They do not have enough vehicles to cover all of the construction details, as you know. PSE&G, Altice, all of these different utilities have been in doing work. Um, so the pickup trucks allow the police department to carry larger materials, such as traffic cones and barricades, to be able to get to the locations. Um, any questions? Questions? All right. And the final one is um, authorizing a brook cleanup by Temple Israel. They're going to do a cleanup of the Dunham Trail. The village provides the tools and uh, safety equipment um, for them to borrow, and it's been approved by the village engineer. When, when's that happening? I think, it, uh, I think one of the dates already happened. Um, and there's two other dates they have in mind. It's in the resolution, I believe. Let's open a public comment. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Good evening. Saurabh Dani, 390 Bedford Road, Ridgewood. Um, again, I'm speaking here in my personal capacity. Um, thank you for the robust discussion on West Glen sidewalk and on the bridge projects that were re-added to the agenda today. 
and thank you for allocating monies for the bridge and partial amount for the sidewalk. That's some progress, so I thank you for that. Um, again, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, but the routes to school is a municipal responsibility. That comes from municipal budget. That does not come from school budgets. The crossing guards are provided by the municipal government. Um, and when I was in Secaucus, uh, the previous place where I used to live, I was at a similar meeting where um, when sidewalk was not provided um, and the distance by school district um, considered distance less than two miles, they had to run special buses for those students and it was charged back to the municipal government. So I think maybe our neighborhood will have to go to the school board and request busing for the students that they consider under two miles and that money will probably be charged back to municipal government or additional crossing guards should be provided for uh, crossing um, on the side of the road until this project is completed. So it is a municipal uh, responsibility and municipal government will have to somehow pay the money either by busing, by crossing guards or uh, some way. Uh, but, but I thank you for uh, at least funding it partially. Um, I, I would like to understand from the uh, council or not, if not today at, at some point, what is that cap of 7.5 million? Why can that bond be not 7.7 .7 million? Or if it is 7.7, .7, why can it not be 7.9 million? What is a, a project that is in flight, completing that project in one shot where some residence part is done and some is not done for $200,000 in a 57, 58 million dollar budget? Like what is that? Is it a statutory cap that you can only raise $7.25 million bond or $7.7 .7 million? What is that an arbitrary number that you have pulled? What is the rationale for that number? Why can it not be a 200,000 extra bond when we are going out for a bond? And um, we, uh, we heard about the sidewalks and accessibility. Um, I wanted to just bring up a point that Mayor Hache or Commissioner Hache had told at one of the Rotary Club meetings that um, the village has not provided uh, curb cuts for a lot of county roads to the county and until those curb cuts are provided, the county does not repave the roads. So if, our si if we are doing sidewalks and if they are not ADA compliant, then in future we may not, the county may not repave those roads until we make them ADA compliant. So if we are working on something, that should be ADA compliant. Otherwise, on a county road, repaving will be, become an issue at a later date. And um, um, I want to thank you, uh, Evan, for answering the budget questions, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things that I'm still not clear that the COVID-related state funds or federal funds that came, those were for one time or part, two times, like a short term additional expenses that we had. So we should be going back to pre-COVID expenses. So what are our expenses that are increasing pre-COVID? The COVID funds were needed for additional COVID expenses. So if you are going back to our pre-COVID expenses, if you don't have any additional extraordinary expenses for COVID, we don't need those extraordinary funds. And then um, the anything related to state, uh, the healthcare expense increase, um, the state has promised to fund $200 million to municipal governments, and that, isn't, that may not have passed yet. The budget will probably pass in July. And three years ago, uh, I remember Board of Ed had a $562,000 healthcare waiver above and beyond 200,000, a 2% tax. And then when in July the final budget was approved by the governor, then that Board of Ed and uh, it was, uh, the president was Mr. Longto, that Board of Ed refunded that $562,000 to the residents. So once the governor approved the budget. So if you are being given a reason, I, I know you may not have, be you not, like look, going through every line item, you're relying on uh, your uh, staff, but if you are being told that healthcare is, costs are going up and that's the reason for that 4% increase, once the governor funds that, uh, hopefully he'll uh, refund that back to the uh, residents because that's what Board of Ed did three years ago, three or four years ago. Thank you. Thanks, Saurabh. Uh, Rorick. Holiday 1 Franklin Avenue. Uh, part of the problem with uh, West Glen is that the village dropped the ball on Glen Wood. They dropped the ball on Glen Wood when the New Jersey Transit gave us an opportunity to come up with a plan to widen Glen Wood to make it 
really two ways but wide and they would continue maintaining it as a two-way street. We dropped the ball even though certain members of the council would talk about, oh, we work so tirelessly. Whenever the council members talk about we work tirelessly, to me it meant we worked incompetently. Now that diverted a lot of traffic to West Glen, which is making it a problem worse. And very frankly, and again following the rules that set by uh, our esteemed uh, village council, let me respond to Lorraine Reynolds. That is a cheap shot when you start talking about, oh, you prefer Shuttler to safety. Where were you in the last four years when $2.6 million went into that crummy house and there wasn't a single word that I heard and I've come to meeting after meeting after meeting about sidewalks on West Glen. It's, it's, it's a silly. You, you just, you don't make them look bad. You excuse make yourself me, look bad. Excuse me. No, Rourke, I'm sorry, Rourke, I'm going to continue because Rourke, she addressed. Let's, let's listen. Let's all have a discussion without making accusations. Well, she made and accusations, and me. I need to respond to them. Rourke, excuse, excuse me, you do not have the microphone? I'm here. I am asking for people to not be rude. Okay. And if someone insists on being rude, take us to court. But we're going to try and we're going to try and we're going to try and be nice to one another in this room. We can be critical, and we can be nice. We don't have to be nice, but we don't have to be rude. And I apply that rule to everybody. Okay. So I'll do my best continue. to be critical and not rude. I don't think I'm being rude. I'm being critical. Please be okay. critical. Now, let me slightly just, nicer. Now, right? also, as far as the uh, now, I, I need to catch up on time. Uh, as far as the meeting of CSAC uh, and uh, that Lorraine, uh, I brought you up to date. When I used to complain about why Franklin Avenue was not being paved, I would always get the reason: Oh, we're waiting on the county. We're waiting on the county. I spoke to the county. And they basically said, we're waiting on the village. They had to finish the curbs and the ramps. When they did that, the highway, the road was, uh, was, was uh, resurfaced. Now, before you all get together to go down the county to complain about the lights, let me read two letters. I did contact the county. And by the way, the county is fantastic as far as responding, unlike the village in the old days where you my emails went into a big, big hole somewhere. But basically, I asked, uh, <clears throat> regarding the traffic lights at Maple, uh, Franklin, and Franklin Oak, where do we expect these to be redone? This is what I wrote to the county. The county responded, and I thank them for resurfacing Franklin Avenue. They said, please note that the traffic signals are not under county jurisdiction and the village of Ridgewood plays a major role in the development and advancement of the projects. The county unfortunately is not able to advance the projects without the involvement of the village. Okay? As the 2023 administration settles in, I'm sure that they will consider and evaluate all prospective projects that they deem essential to potentially undertake. So before you go down to complain to the county they're not doing their work, I suggest you sit down with Heather, you sit down with Chris Rutischhauser and find out what it is they're not doing before the county could come in. So don't circle the wagon, wagons around the village of Ridgewood. Get the facts and don't just listen to what is being told to you because I'm telling you the village, the county is waiting, waiting for the village for us to do things before they can do anything. Thank you. And by the way, if I was rude to anyone, I apologize. But what I cannot stand is anybody who gets horribly disingenuous and rude to their fellow council members. Thank you. Thank you, Rourke. Hi. Me Too Mystery 416, uh, Colwell Court. I actually want to thank Lorraine for being such a great advocate 
for uh, the concerned residents of Ridgewood. I think you've been really consistent. I really appreciate appreciate you very much. Um, the council, I really appreciate. I really do appreciate your willingness to revisit this project. I do, and acknowledge how important it is, and committing to some type of progress this year. Um, that being said, Lorraine read my mind. It's still unfortunately going to be a sidewalk to nowhere, and it really doesn't make anyone safer. Um, and I wish Chris was here because I would have asked them this question. Do we, if I, I personally, I feel I'm just going to use a little analogy I tell my kids. You know when you ask your kids to do the dishes and they do all the dishes but they leave all the pots and it leaves you more irritated and it's like you didn't help me. You still left a lot. Of, it's, that's how I feel if you don't finish this. It's just, it's like the worst, the most annoying part is still there. So. I have, my question would be, if you, for whatever reason, I do think you can find the money because I think going from a hundred thousand, a million to a three hundred thousand, that's huge. That's a huge savings, and you want to take it to a hundred. I don't think you need to. I think you can get it done at three hundred. Um, but if for some reason you can't and you want to do a section, what I would want to ask the engineers is, could you, instead of starting from the tree where it stopped, could you start from S Hill? Because that 172 West Glen, if you stand there and look to the corner of S Hill, that's where there's no shoulder to walk in on either side. That is the most dangerous part. That's where the, there's all the trees, the line of sight. That's the worst part. If you're going to do one section, please do that section. Because that's what would make it much safer. Um, I don't, I can't, I, I'm not an engineer at all. I can't imagine how you would do that section without a retaining wall because it is a big hill. Um, let's see. Um, because right now with what you're proposing, basically the kids will walk, not the kids, everyone. You'll walk to the edge of the sidewalk and then where it ends, there's nowhere to go but hop into the street. There's nowhere to go. You're potentially making it even more dangerous by not completing it because you're taking them closer to that part with no shoulders. Um, I think, I think, oh, I, I just want to talk about the Board of Ed and something that somebody touched upon. I, I can't remember who said this, but this is all political. And I've, I've been talking about this since I moved to Ridgewood, before I even knew about the Village Council, before I even knew who the mayor was at the time. It's not about I like this, pe this person, I hate this. It's not about that. This is about wanting safety. I don't care who's up there. I don't care who did what last time and who's doing what this time. Just, just make it safer. Just, just everyone should care about safety and just get it done. And I think, the, I think you can do it. Um, and a, one, this is my last thing. You guys, unfortunately, don't agree on everything. This is a little bit of a divided council, unfortunately, about big projects like Shedler. This is one thing you're all unanimously agreeing on. You're saying, yeah, we all agree this is a safety issue, and let's all put our resources towards it. So why not put your energy towards something you all actually agree on where you are getting um, the wide support? That's all I'm going to say for now. I'm sure I'll say more, but thank you. Thank you, Nitty. Cynthia O'Keefe, 542 West Saddle River Road. So um, obviously tonight's theme is safety, and that's a great thing, and I'm really grateful to hear that some of the people that I've met that I feel are friends now, um, their concerns are being addressed. Um, and just because you voted on a large turf field on April 12th doesn't mean that I'm not going to come up here and ask you time and time again at every single meeting to address my concerns and give us some answers. And we're not Shedler people. We're people in the Shedler community. We're neighbors. Just like the sports people don't want to be, that's pejorative to call them sports people. To call people Shedler people I think is disrespectful. I'm just going to put it out there. So please respect that. Um, and I think I come up here week after week respecting all of you for your accomplishments and to listen and to understand and really hear what's going on and what our concerns are. So I don't feel like I've gotten the answers that I feel like any of us deserve. Um, I'm still asking about safety. Safety is a huge issue. 
Um, if you want your, we all understand Shedler costs a lot of money. I get it. Um, but, you know, and I've heard a couple of comments over the last several weeks that it could have been a 7-Eleven. Well, you know what? That's really insulting too, okay? And I think about this stuff every day. You know, today I just found out that you're trying to buy my neighbor's property right across the street. And I have to hear about that through a group chat. It's, it's unfathomable how little transparency there is and how we have not gotten any answers. And I have a private well, and potentially, maybe not now, but when that turf field does go in, I'm gonna be thinking about that every day. And you can all go home to your homes and rest your head on the pillow, and I hope I'm gonna be able to do that too. I just don't understand why we're not getting answers. Uh, I don't know if I have to come to that special council session that you have on May, whatever it is, 6th, and sit there in a room with you to get those answers. I, I don't know. This isn't a dialogue. This is a one-way conversation. And it's extremely frustrating. It's emotional. It's taking a toll on so many people. And the town is divided. Like, I'm probably not a very liked person because I'm a Shedler person but I'm not gonna be sorry for that. I live in a neighborhood that I love and I would like to continue to love it. And you're, you know, we're, we're being pinned against people that we care about. I have a lot of people that I love in this town that play sports and they say, well, you just don't understand it. You just don't want the field in your backyard. That's not the truth. That's not what's happening. But we have safety concerns, just like they're concerned about people not having a sidewalk to walk on. We have cars coming off of Route 17 onto West Saddle River Road at 65 miles an hour. There are no sidewalks on our street, very few actually. Maybe one little tiny path to nowhere, um, you know, as you mentioned before. So, you know, that's gonna also need to be addressed. If they're gonna walk to this half a million dollar parking lot down the street, how are they gonna get there? They're gonna be walking in the street. It's a very narrow street. So I keep saying the same things over and over and I'd like someday to actually get an answer to some of those issues that I'm bringing up. So it's safety, it's our, you know, our health and our safety and our environment. You remove all the trees, it compromises our air quality. We talked about proclamation on trees last week. Very important and I agree wholeheartedly Arbor Day Foundation, all that good stuff. And you have people working on these boards and these committees, and I've attended some of them. These people are great. They're busting their butts to, to produce all this information. And actually, David Refkin mentioned that when, um, before the vote, he and his team had put together tons of data on PFAS, and we know Lorraine and Pam both didn't vote on the, the turf, but none of the other of you even got back to David to say, sorry, can't meet with you. I'm too busy. Nobody. And that's what he said verbatim at that meeting. I know, Pam, you were there, so you, I know you heard what he said. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. So you have all these people. Why are these boards and these committees doing things, passing the Green Amendment or doing you know, other things when it's contradictory to the way you're, you're not walking the talk? That's all I have to say. I appreciate listening to me and, and hearing my concerns, but I would like some answers at some point. And I'm, I don't feel like we're getting that respect. And we are now marginalized people. And I had to look up the, the word today, marginalized, because I really wanted to understand it. And I've never felt that way before in my life until now. Time Thank is you. Up. Thank you, Cynthia. Jacqueline Holm, 30 Carriage Lane. I am going to continue on from what Cynthia uh, just said. So one of my biggest concerns is that we do attend these meetings and um, committee meetings, and there's a lot of misinformation. So I'll just start. Last night, people asked for the celebration of the house, when in fact it was only one person that it was actually a question. When and if the house is completed, where there'll be, where will there be an opening into celebration? But it's automatically people asked. So that gives an illusion that it's a group of people and it's only one person. Neighbors, we heard from the first speaker, 
Matt Rossi, neighbors asked for the acquisition of the properties, specifically said that the neighbors brought 501 West Saddle River Road in the acquisition of that property um, to acquire, when in fact, now we know, that's not really what happened, and it was only one person that came forward. Residents asking for a footbridge, I heard tonight. Well, I believe that it's been the same person week after week, and it's maybe one or two people. Sports representatives stood here week after week saying, on behalf of the organization, 1,000 plus participants, I'd like to qu uh, caution and just say, unless we have um, information where the 1,000 plus participants have actually signed a document saying that they can be represented on behalf of one person or residents on behalf of a footbridge or residents. I also heard Glen Sidewalks, there's representatives of that neighborhood and it was four people and I'm not knocking them. But then there's a stark contradiction when a group of Shedler residents within the community wasn't just one person, four people, five people, or nine people, you were actually presented with 200 plus individually signed letters from people of the Shedler neighborhood. And you gave attention to the sports people, to the footbridge people, to the sidewalk people, to the sports representatives again, but the Shedler residents have gotten zero absolutely no response, months after months, scientific data, proven concerns, and yet not one answer from this village council in regards to what Cynthia had said. We have concerns that are not questionable. They are in fact true. Your own green amendment says that. You're going to remove seven acres of trees and that's going to cause exposure to air pollution, noise pollution, there will be traffic, there will be safety concerns, but yet this council refuses week after week, month after month, has not yet done one study, one move, has not questioned one person as to how that will impact the residents in the community. It doesn't mean your plan doesn't get to go through. I spoke with Pam about this last night. You can still have your plan. You can carpet from one end to the other if you wanted, as long as you mitigate the impact. What does that mean? I don't know if it's a noise wall, if it's more trees, if it's, let the experts tell us, how do you mitigate airborne particulates off of a major highway? How do you mitigate the children playing on that playground from inhaling the fumes that are gonna be coming off of that highway? How do you mitigate the wildlife that's gonna be impacted? Your design is hyper-focused on driving through a field, but you won't address the concerns of 200 plus individuals that have signed letters and submitted to you. And my question is why? Why such gross negligence? Why such deliberate and intentional, complete, utter disregard for 200 and plus individually signed letters and people who have come up repeatedly for months asking those questions? We deserve answers, just the way the three people that came forward with the footbridge, the four people that came forward with the sidewalks, the handful of sports rep that said they were representing people why such a difference of treatment Time. to the people within the Shedler community? Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to speak this evening. For the record, my perception as I sit in the back of the room where I usually sit is that every single time there is mention of the previous council, all heads on the dais turn 
to Lorraine Reynolds. For the record, Ms. Perrin was elected and is serving for as long as Ms. Reynolds was serving. For the record, Mayor Vagianos is not new. He was elected to the council in 2021 and took office in November of 2021. So all of you are not new. Some have been around for the previous council and were members of the previous council. So let us not turn heads and all look at Ms. Reynolds when everybody says something about the previous council. There was some talk this evening about the use of social media. The village attorney gave his comments. Quite frankly, I don't think there is a difference between blocking and hiding comments. Both are unacceptable. Both, in my perception, were, not, were unlawful. There's no difference. If you were hiding comments that for some reason you might not have liked, it's the same as blocking a person. You didn't want their comments to appear. Based upon what the attorney said, it was my belief that there was some admission that that was taking place. Again, unacceptable in my opinion. There was also some discussion about the use of a heavily censored and a regulated Facebook page in which discussions about official business were being made. The attorney's comment was that there's nothing unlawful about that because that's not a page that the person in question is controlling. However, in my opinion, there is some ethical issue associated with that and some moral issue. Perhaps legal, but in my opinion, not ethical nor moral, and that practice should be stopped. There was also a comment made this evening, which I took great offense at, regarding the acquisition or alleged plan to acquire 510 West Saddle River Road as, well, you know, you should have known about it because it is the council's position from time to time to acquire properties that are adjacent to parkland. Come on, how low can you go? We should have known about it because it was land that was adjacent to a parkland, we should have known that the council was likely to acquire that? Oh, come on. I didn't go to Harvard, but I'm a lot smarter to know that you know, that, that was just totally, totally uncalled for and unacceptable. There was also a comment made tonight that it is reasonable to do things in small chunks with respect to the crosswalks on West Glen. Well, why isn't it then reasonable to do small things in small chunks with respect to Shedler? I don't understand. It's reasonable to do things in, with small, in small chunks with respect to one initiative, but not another initiative. Another comment that I felt was totally out of place and basically insults the intelligence of the public. I also agree that it's a sidewalk to nowhere. Unless you build that sidewalk down to S Hill, uh, you know, you're building the sidewalk for the children to walk safely. Why just build it through a couple of homes? Doesn't make any sense to me. Build it all the way down to S Hill and get it done with. Uh, I was unable to, to attend nor watch the public meeting that took place two weeks ago, but I would like to comment on something on that. I did notice that during the public hearings that were held during that meeting, that the mayor would look up and indicate, I don't see anyone at the mic, therefore I'm going to move on. I would remind you that those public hearings are being advertised, that they're available by Zoom now also, and the mayor should have been checking the computer to make sure that there was nobody on Zoom who was waiting to address it at the public hearing also. You never said that you were doing it, so I'm not sure if you did it, but if you weren't doing it, People can comment by Zoom at public hearings now, and the computer should be checked to make sure that those people aren't excluded. Uh, my last comment is that the manager made some comments today about irrigation. I would remind her that if you have smart controllers, you can water seven days a week. I was totally against that, but that's the way it went, and I'll come back to that at a later date and try to put my two cents in again. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, Boyd.
Good evening again. Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Um, I would like to reiterate what my husband said, that it's absolute semantics to, dis to distinguish hiding comments versus blocking comments. I mean, for real, Mr. Mayor, this is transparency. That was really laugh worthy, although apparently we're not supposed to laugh or clap. The hiding was intentional. You were censoring your page. You're not doing it anymore. Secondly, um, the village attorney stated that I accepted his response to my concerns about Ms. Winograd's Facebook activity on a censored page. I don't think I said that, but go ahead. You did. I In did fact, know. Ellie even wrote me and said you accepted it. I didn't accept it, and as um, Mr. Rogers, not. I'm he sure knows, agree. I, I sent a point-by-point point detailed response to that, so I did not accept it at all. You did not. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Winograd has absolute control over where and what she posts. She, you, are participating in an official, as an elected official, on a censored Facebook page. In the middle of discussions, people get knocked off. Some people in this room and a number of other people. And yet you continue to do it. The ACLU clearly states that this is wrong. You, elected officials have to participate in discussions online that are open to everyone. The only place that you can reasonably do that is on your own village government page, which is Winograd 2022. You can post about missing dogs or favorite restaurants or whatever, but not about village business. Lastly, on April 6, I requested and I put in an Oprah request for one item from Mayor Vagiano's Facebook page. That is part of the public domain because it is his official mayor's page. There's seven days to respond to an Oprah request. April 17th was seven days. On April 18th, I was told that I would need an extension till April 25th. Today, April 26th, I was told that there would be another extension to May 9th. That's an additional 16 days above what's legally allowed. I spoke to Eileen, who could not have been more gracious, and this is definitely not her fault. She said specifically, the document has not been received. Now, the only way that the document, which is a specific request about one post on the mayor's Facebook page, can legitimately not be provided in seven days is this. If the record is in use or in storage, otherwise there must be, a, th th those are the two legitimate reasons. So you're in violation by not providing this information. This is not something that's hundreds of pages of documents. It's not emails and emails that have to be redacted and checked. It's one thing that I asked for, and you are stonewalling it. And so once again, Mr. Mayor, you're running a ship here that is censoring and controlling, and it's not working out well. You've been in office as mayor for four months, and it's really just three months and change. There's just not going well. You need to straighten up, follow the law, and, you know, be transparent like you say you are. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. I'm going to try this again. Robin Fisher, 412 North Monroe. I want to begin by saying thank you for having this discussion. This has actually been a project in the works for as long as I've been a resident in Ridgewood, so for over 10 years. So it's not really new. And I, I appreciate your sentiments about your concerns, but I kind of need to put your money where your mouth is, kind of, right? We need to be concerned and do something. I do think that, Lorraine, I apologize if I'm using your first name versus your surname. <laughs> uh, I can't. <laughs> but, if we do have 500, and I get it, you don't want to use all of it, that's fine. And I appreciate the mayor's suggestion of let's compromise. Absolutely. I'm going to agree with Needy. There's that curve, it's with Stina, that S, let's do something there. Because if you look at what we've already accomplished, and we have accomplished a lot, we're working on completing the project, 
If we do in three years, as you suggested, and we cut the million and divide it by three, do my math, but you know, we're talking about three plus hundred, right? So let's do that. Let's do the 300, if not 500, if that's not okay, and let's work on it. If you look and you are walking, I don't think it's ideal, but it is what it is until the three years are up. But we've kind of created sidewalks on half and half, you know, it's kind of like a patchwork. If we took and looked at where we don't have anything and start addressing that, does that make sense? Like there are some sections that have one side paved and then there's another section that has nothing. Then we can look at how to patch these holes. We're gonna have to do something about crossing lights because you still have kids. You've done one with the sign for the autistic child and then you've done the flashing lights. That has worked really great because it kind of says, hey, watch out, there's someone here. So maybe we can get one on the Wistina, that curve that Needy was talking about. That would be a great way to say, hey guys, you got four intersections here, because you got Alpine, you've got Wistina. That's another way to say, you got kids crossing. Pause, you know, slow down. I know it's not everything, but those are quick fixes that we can add. I agree, you know, the sign that says 25 would be great, and we could put it every, every house, and it still wouldn't make a difference because people just barrel it. And people running the light, uh, that's what I'm calling the accidents for, they're just ignoring the light altogether. So, you know, if we could get those beginning. The other thing I would like to point out, and I know I'm not gonna be popular on this, but the driveways that we're all very concerned about, are encroaching on public property. I don't mean to be rude, but when it comes to children and someone's abuse of that walkway, I'm not gonna be sympathetic, I'm sorry. I mean, you took the benefit, awesome, but the kids' lives and adults' lives are at stake, I don't care. I mean, that wasn't your property to develop to begin with. First 10 feet aren't anybody's, it's yours. So. You don't have to ask permission. You kind of have to just take it back. And you have really the support on, on not just for people because this project has been going on for so long that it's kind of hard to come every week. But we've emailed you, we've, we've sent the request, you have support and you have it from anybody. I mean, it doesn't have to be someone living on West Glen. It has to be anybody who wants to go to town or anybody who wants to go from you know, Hohokus and Cross, like, I mean, it's everywhere. We all run, we all walk, we have dogs, we all have cats, no, I mean cats, no. But, you know, we have bicycles, we have everything. So there's a lot of people who want this project, and I think safety has to be number one. So thank you for reaching a compromise and funding back this project. And to be honest, do the best you can. I know it's not ideal, I mean, 100, honestly, is not a lot, but just, an inch at a time, I don't care. Just let's get it done. And if you want to take your million dollars, split it evenly into three years, you kind of got a little more than 100 there. <laughs> so hopefully you can do this. And thank you for standing up for the sidewalks because I think that it's a very important project. It's not fancy, it's not, you know, it's not medals and trophy cups, but it is our kids. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. And we have a few residents on our hybrid access. The first one is Susan. All right, thank you. I was worried that we wouldn't be able to talk this time. Um, thank you again, or thank you again for letting me speak. Um, my name is Susan Ruan. Um, I live at 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Thank you for bringing up Kingsbridge. Um, Susan, I will, I will just remind you, we, we end our meetings at 11. Uh, and, I know, I'm trying to, and there are, trust and me, there mine are, is not that word. If I, yeah, there are three people behind so, you, so we just want to try and get everyone in. Yeah. No, I'll try to finish up. Um, I would like to advise the village council that there are no sidewalks on East Saddle River Road. So if there, if you made the, wheel, the bridge um, <clears throat> wheelchair accessible, the wheelchairs will have to be forced to go onto East Saddle River Road with cars. Um, the reason the old village council decided to seek outside engineers 
to design the footbridge to repair it because it didn't make sense to make um, the footbridge wheelchair accessible. There were no sidewalks. Um, there's approximately 30,000 more needed between the funds that are already allocated and what is to um, the engineer's estimate to fix the footbridge versus over ha half a million to fix the, to put the wheelchair accessible. And that means, and you would have to spend another hundreds of thousands of dollars to add the sidewalks. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I hope the village council moves forward to repairing the footbridge versus um, making it wheelchair accessible. Finally, will how will residents be notified of the discussion at the closed door uh, meeting tonight with the um, property acquisition? Or do residents need to do an open request to find out the closed door discussion? Thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Susan. Leo, you're up. Oh, yep. Leo, you're up. You're on mute. And again, I remind you, there are a couple Hi. of people behind you. We want to try and get everyone in. Hi, good evening. Leo Ruan, 705 Kings Beach Lane. Uh, thank you, Councilman, for taking, our council members for taking my uh, call. Um, I would just, I, I would just like to say that the Fudge Bridge by East Little River Road um, it has been out now in May. It'll be four years. So this is a long time for the community here on the east side, the neglected east side community, uh, to be um, without that utility. Um, I know that, you know, the kids have to now go 20 minutes out of their way to go all the way around to try and go into the town. I, I actually know that there's been um, some kids that have been hit by cars on their bikes on, on their way in because they're being forced to uh, take that extended journey. So it was safety, uh, for the safety of the children of our community, um, we'd like the council to, at some point, finish this bridge, um, uh, try and get the funding for it. Um, also, I think a council member said there was, you know, oh, let's, uh, why can't we put a wheelchair there? Uh, maybe the council members can come over and look at the bridge. I know the previous mayor did come over and um, um, talk to us at the bridge. If you go to the other side of the bridge on East Island River Road, you will see there's no sidewalk. So wheelchair to where? You know, sidewalk to where? Wheelchair to where? It just be, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. And finally, I'd, I'd, um, you know, I, I'd heard uh, tonight that the council say, um, you know, Shedder Park, but in our opinion and the opinion of a lot of the residents here, I think a couple of hundred people signed a petition. That's not, not going to be a park. It's going to be a sports complex. There is no real, it will not look like a park. So I just wanted to, uh, to, to put that on the record. Thank you so much. I yield my time. Thank you, Leo. Mary Lou, you're up. Thank you very much. Mary Lou Handy, seven, um, 695 Kingsbridge Lane. And tonight's um, buzzword is safety. I live two doors down from the um, footbridge that we've been unable to use for four years. I have five children. We'd like to walk across the footbridge to get over to Starbucks on the other side of 17. We've walked downtown for a nice long, long walk, but those options are no longer accessible to us because of the inaccessibility of using this bridge for such a long time. The other issue is we want to have this bridge back for the people who live in the Salem Ridge area who wish to come to Shedlow. They won't be able to get here easily and safely until this bridge is reopened. We want to have this bridge open as quickly as we can. We moved to the neighborhood knowing we had access to downtown and other places via the bridge. And then when it was deemed unsafe and closed, that really has been a severe handicap for you know these four years. You may or may not know that the children at Ridgewood High School run, the cross-country team runs through our neighborhood, and they climb over the barricades day after day. And then they run on East Saddle River Road 
oh, by the way, which has no sidewalks at all. We talked about how we can get to the other side safely without the bridge. We have to walk over the overpass to the park and ride. There's no safe way to walk from the overpass onto the park and ride property to get to downtown. There are no sidewalks on Route 17 either. If the bridge was that delayed until we researched and see if it could be made, you know, wheelchair accessible, which is an admirable, good, great idea, but it will be more dangerous for any individual in a wheelchair coming over a bridge and be put right onto East Saddle River Road with no buffer. A wheelchair cannot maneuver on the grass and on the tree roots that they would have to go over to get towards East Glen Avenue where there are sidewalks. There's probably nearly a mile on East Saddle River Road with no sidewalks. And to save and to spend the excess funds, the excess time to build a bridge, which I think is admirable that would be wheelchair accessible as a senior citizen, who knows what might happen to me when I want to go to Glen School to, to watch my grandchildren play, but it wouldn't be safe to be down the ramp and into the middle of a very, very, very busy road. So I just want to say we need this bridge to be open as quickly as possible to hear that it may be delayed for further discussion and study and funding requests and then be delayed and have some of it done is really disheartening. And anything we can do to expedite this and really understand by coming over here and, and see for yourselves that we have no sidewalk and to spend the time and money to put in a wheelchair accessible bridge will really delay and perhaps doom this project. I thank you very much for listening to us and um, it's 11 o'clock and well, just a few moments. So if there's somebody behind me, I want to give them some time. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. And we have one more person, Kevin. You're up. You're on mute, Kevin. Perfect. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Kevin One, uh, 147 West Glen Avenue. Uh, I appreciate the fact that all the council members uh, tonight are uh, express their concern about pedestrian safety and the sidewalks that had been built uh, along Glen Avenue over the past few years had brought significant improvements on that regard. So it's like day and day. In the past, when I was uh, basically walking along the Glen, uh, Glen Avenue or biking, I was so scared by those cars zooming by. Uh, but with some section of the sidewalk completed, I was able to you know, feel safe um, back on the roads. So it's like, you know, that feeling uh, make village, a uh, Ridgewood village, like my town again. I'm not, I work in the city. I don't want to, you know, come back, for, you know, from the city to home and feel like I'm, I'm in the city again, biking or walking along the busy traffic. That kind of feeling uh, is, is surreal. Um, I would also like to urge all council members to stop by at West Glen Avenue or drive through the stretch of the road to see for your own eyes. Only by doing so um, will you be able to experience what we, uh, the residents of the West Glen, experience every day to see, uh, in my opinion, the most dangerous section of the entire Ridgewood, whereas S Hill, uh, West Glen, and Heights intersect. And uh, finally, I would uh, want to add that, and I believe all my dear neighbors will say the same, that if any modification to our properties is needed, we are more than willing to work with the village and the county to make this project happen. So reach out to us and we will work with you. Let's carry on, let's keep the momentum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. And with that, I'm going to close public comment and we'll proceed. Be it resolved by the Village Council of the Village of Ridgewood that the Village Council meet in closed session on April 26, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. or as soon thereafter as a matter on the agenda can be reached and that said closed session be held in the fourth floor caucus room of Ridgewood Village Hall, 131 North Maple Avenue, Ridgewood, New Jersey and be it further resolved that the matters to be discussed in closed session are limited to legal possible acquisition of property, personnel, boards and committees and emergency medical services. These matters are allowable under NJSA 10 colon 4-12 at SEC and be it further resolved 
that the minutes of this meeting shall be made available to the general public when such matters have been deemed completed by resolution of the village council. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Perrin? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Bagianos? Yes.